Good evening and welcome to our Thousand Oaks City Council meeting for September 28th. Would you please join us in pledging allegiance to the flag? Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam Clerk, would you please do the roll call? Councilmember Adam? Here. Councilmember Jones? Here. Councilmember McNamee? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Engler? Here. And Mayor Bill De La Pena? Present. Thank you very much. We don't have any requests for a continuance of any hearing or agenda item. So we will go straight to special presentations. And this is going to be a special one. I am pleased to be able to introduce you to this month's recipient of the Community Commitment Award. And her name is Andrea Usum. In 2015, about six years ago, Andrea and four other local moms founded the Conejo Community Outreach Organization as a way to give back to the community by providing essential supplies, such as food and diapers to families in need. In the past six years, they have provided over 300,000 diapers to Thousand Oaks and Ventura County families. Conejo Community Outreach also hosts an annual Thanksgiving event, which provides traditional Thanksgiving fixings to approximately 75 families in the city. In addition to the extensive amount of work that Andrea does for Conejo Community Outreach, she is also very active as a volunteer in her children's school, and she gives generously to many other local nonprofits. It is my pleasure now to introduce you to Andrea Yusim. Hello, I'm Claudia Bill de la Pena, mayor of the city of Thousand Oaks. And today I am here with the September honoree of our wonderful Community Commitment Award. And her name is Andrea Yusim of the Conejo Community Outreach. Congratulations. Thank you. Here you go. You were nominated because you have done tremendous work since day one for the Conejo Community Outreach Organization. You are actually one of the co-founders, I understand, and this is the sixth year anniversary for your group. Tell me how you came up with the idea. Um, in 2015, we began as a modest holiday relief, just trying to help people get their Thanksgiving meals together. And people wanted to donate to us with actual um, food donations, but they also wanted to give us funds. And we decided we wanted to do it totally above the line and just start with an actual formal organization. And then we also want to run a year-round diaper bank, which we've run since 2018. We've just been ramping up every year since. That is unbelievable. How many volunteers do you have and how many hours does it take to run a nonprofit organization? Everybody runs it at this point. It's, it's many, many hours and everybody does their part. We have five wonderful board members, including myself, and then we have some great volunteers from the high schools who come and help fill diaper orders because we do so many each week, it would be impossible to do on our own. Everybody in the organization right now is a volunteer, right? Yes, we are entirely volunteer run and always have been. We've really never paid anybody for anything except to do our taxes and to be insured. What kind of feedback do you get from the, uh, the residents that benefit from your service? The main feedback that we get is that it's a crucial service. They simply wouldn't be able to have the ease of the end of the month that they do um, without us. Diapers are not cheap no. at all. And so the service that you provide is really critical. Was the need for diapers higher during the uh, lockdown? Yes, our needs, our requests skyrocketed. Our immediate problem was that a lot of um, workers around here were in the restaurant and service industries, and those were the very first things that shut down. And there's an entire cohort um, who have two parents 
in those industries. So they had no income at all, and it quickly became, where can we help these families with the most basic things just to keep them going month mm -hmm. after month? We did 50,000 diapers total prior to the pandemic, and since March 2020, we have done 285,000 diapers and around half a million wipes to those in Ventura County. Wow. That is a large number. It's a huge increase. <laughs> Giant. <laughs> yes, indeed. Did you ever think that Conejo Community Outreach would grow as large and play as big a role as it does now? I did not. I thought we would stay small, just sort of be this niche. We absolutely could not operate without the support of our community. And they have jumped at the chance to give us funds and actual diapers get dropped off on my porch all the time. And mm. people are constantly asking, how can we help? How can my child help? I'm really proud of what we've done. I know it's crucial. I, it's diapers. Andrea, I uh, nominated you to be recognized by the City of Thousand Oaks for this Community Commitment Award um, because I am so grateful that you took the time to care about our community and to uh, meet with other women to start a nonprofit. And I think a lot of people don't necessarily get to see the amount of work you do behind the scenes. Um, and don't necessarily understand how much work it goes into not only running a nonprofit, but making the diaper bank possible. And so everything from the paperwork that you make sure gets filed, to helping with our finances, to planning logistics, um, to overseeing our orders, you know, I, that is what makes us be able to run this diaper bank. And um, I really wanted to make sure that we as a community shared with you how important the work you do is, and um, we're just really grateful, and I'm so grateful to be a part of it with you. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for giving to your community very quietly, as you have been doing for the last six years, and we want to shine the light on you, and that is the reason why we have the Community Commitment Award after more than a year of a lockdown uh, with this COVID pandemic. We wanted to bring you rays of light that brighten our community and Andrea is certainly one of them. If you know someone who deserves to be recognized, someone who has been under the radar giving back to our community, please go to our website www.toaks.org forward slash CCA and we're looking forward to bringing you the honorees for the next few months in this remaining year 2021. Thank you. And we have Andrea joining us this evening via Zoom without all of the diapers in the background. Hello, Andrea. Congratulations once again. I see you. Can we, um, can we bring her in? Andrea, what is really remarkable also is that you as a nonprofit organization, you don't really have an office. You work out of your homes. And so, um, of course, that cuts down on the overhead, but that sh also shows how committed you are. When, when is your next diaper drive or wipe drive? We do diaper drives any day of the week. If any Boy Scout, Girl Scout, school, any organization would like to do a diaper drive, we would love that. We turn over more diapers than you can imagine. So we will gladly take them at any time. And how can our viewers, people who are watching right now, reach you? How, how uh, will they know where to drop them off or when to drop them off? Do you have a website address? We do. It is www.conejocommunityoutreach.com and you can reach any of us at all times at board at conejocommunityoutreach.com. Excellent. Thank you so much. Continue the wonderful work. Our community appreciates you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. That is, again, my, my favorite part of the evening usually is the Community Commitment Award. And if you, again, as I mentioned, have someone that you would like to nominate, just go to our website, www.toaks.org forward slash CCA. And with that, we will now go to public comments and we'll call on Madam Clerk. 
this is the time and place for public comments for those wishing to address the city council regarding items on the agenda or on a subject within the city's jurisdiction. All remarks should be addressed to the council as a whole. Speakers are requested to state their name and community of residence for the record. Under state law, public comment matters may not be considered by the council unless listed on the agenda, but may be referred to the city manager for administrative follow-up. Six individuals have requested to speak, and pursuant to council standards, speakers are allowed three minutes. Thank you very much. The first speaker of the evening is Anaí Quiroz Romero, joining us via telephone. Good evening. Members of the city council and neighbors, uh, my name is Anaí Quiroz Romero, and I have lived in the beautiful city of Thousand Oaks for the last 18 years. I am very happy to participate in these city council meetings. I always learn a lot about what's going on in our city, but my intention is to give a voice to the undocumented community because I always feel that if I do not show up, nobody else who is undocumented shows up. Unlike other people who think that they do not have the social responsibility to talk about their lives and teach American citizens the lives that we have lived here, um, I believe that I have that of social responsibility to tell you the experiences that I have had and that my family has had, um, all of them have been positive experiences. Um, on the subject of low-income housing, I wanted to share the story of how my brother, who is a U.S. citizen, I'm not a U.S. citizen, uh, when we were younger and my mom uh, couldn't work because she had coxie meningitis. My brother had to live with us in a garage at a house over at Wycliffe. And we did that for probably two or three years. My brother was a U.S. citizen, but because my mother was not a U.S. citizen, he could not get affordable income housing. And as far as I understand, our undocumented status always affected our ability to reach any of the social programs that were available for others. The reason why I bring this up is I, I want you to think about the U.S. citizen children of undocumented parents who are working in our city, who are um, contributing their labor so that we can have a better life. Um, and I would like us to have a robust working class. And it's very important. Uh, yesterday, when I participated in the planning commission meeting, and we were told that this um, housing project element that we need to um, create so that we can set the stage of where we're going to build this low-income housing, when I heard that this policy had no teeth, um, made me think that no wonder we are where we are, where we always say that we need low-income housing, but we can never get past the conversation of how are we going to do it. Having policy that has no th teeth is the reason why we're not going to do it. Um, so I want you to have that in mind so that maybe this time we can actually have a project that will benefit the community, where we can have some low-income housing for the people that have lived here for the last 10, 20, 30 years because I want us to have a thriving working class. That's how I want Thousand Oaks to be known in the whole country, in the whole state. We support our working class. Thank you, Anayi. Thank you. Our next speaker is Cindy Liu, joining us by video, I believe, followed by Jim. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Cindy Liu. I am the founder and chief advocate of We Belong 805. We're disability justice advocates as well as consultants. Um, I'm calling in tonight to express my extreme disappointment in the antiquated language um, and mindset expressed in the housing plan draft, specifically on page 21. On page 21, the plan refers to people with disabilities as those having, quote, mental retardation, end quote, and the lists 
follows includes alcoholism and those with AIDS. Neither of those are disabilities. Um, this language is not only antiquated, but it's also highly offensive, ableist, and it's very concerning as it breaks public trust in your efforts towards our city's number one goal, which is diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, I'm, I'm calling tonight to also ask um, and your support and encourage the staff and council to provide an articulated framework to the public um, related to your DEI work. Um, we also need to see a dashboard that clearly links spending to articulated expected outcomes. The council approved a two fiscal year budget, which is almost half a billion dollars. And I imagine if that was your own money, you would want to know how that's going to be spent and what you can expect from those dollars. Um, clearly, our staff need some support in understanding um, discriminatory language and mindset. And I think we also need to have expanded representation on planning commissions, as well as traffic commission and any other commission where city council members uh, appoint public. I think we need public representation on that and expand those seats. I certainly appreciate that our city has um, made DEI the number one priority and remains committed in supporting those efforts. But I have to say, seeing what's been made public is very, very saddening and disappointing. Um, and I hope that we have greater progress towards our number one goal or priority. Thank you. Thank you very much. And of course, uh, our apologies for the language that was disturbing. And hopefully that will not happen again. I agree with you 100%, Cindy. Next, we have Jim joining us by audio. If Jim is not present, maybe we can go to the next person. The next person on the list is Kathy Svitek, joining via video. Madam Mayor, can we take a quick break just to make sure that our audio is working appropriately? All right, we will take a quick break, break because we do have some difficulties. One moment. We lose the mayor's audio. No, I'm still yeah, here. Just but stand we, by for a moment, please. Yeah, just one one right. moment.
we are back. We had left off with um, Cindy Lou, and the next speaker is Jim. Good evening, and thank you for your patience. We have Jim next, followed by Kathy Svitek. Jim, we would need you to unmute, please. There you go. Good evening. Very good. My name is Jim Meyer. I've been a resident of Thousand Oaks for 26 years. We'd like to say good, good evening to the mayor and to the city council members. I'm here to speak out against the proposal to change city policy with regard to the use of natural gas and any effort to move to all electric homes. The Climate Change Coalition has been speaking over and over again at city council meetings throughout our state. They chant the same cult-like statement that the world will overheat and be destroyed if we keep using natural gas in our homes. They claim it is the second highest greenhouse gas emitter just behind car emissions. This simply isn't true. The amount of carbon dioxide emitted by the use of natural gas in homes is actually extremely low. So what comes next? The, the city of Thousand Oaks can't afford to entertain proposals like this, which are devoid of data and science and rely on fear mongering. How much of an issue is climate change in Thousand Oaks? What kind of data do we have on emissions? What would the proposal require, or what would the proposal to require all electric homes actually accomplish, other than to virtue signal and supposedly make people feel good about themselves? This isn't the way to conduct city policy. Furthermore, in the past few years, residents in Thousand Oaks have had to deal with power outages. Outages have a number of causes, the primary one being high demand on the electric grid. It is sad that Californians routinely endure rolling blackouts that we have experienced now for a number of years. I urge the city council members to remember these power outages and to not entertain ideas that will only increase the demand for electrical power, which the utilities clearly cannot deliver. The Greenhouse Gas Coalition and the climate change organizations as a whole need to go back to the drawing board on electric homes. We need ideas on how to meet energy demands that currently exist before we pursue ideas that will needlessly increase the demand for electricity. So I would urge the council members to please not uh, entertain these policy changes. And that's all I have. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kathy Svitek. Good evening. Um, Mayor Bill de la Pena and council, thank you for the opportunity to address you this, this evening. I have been a resident of Thousand Oaks since 1968, and I also wish to address the issue of the Greenhouse Gas Coalition and their urgency about making all electric homes. I have two points I'd like to make this evening. The first is quite local, and the other is more global. On the local point, if all new homes become electric, imagine these low-income housing units that the city plans to allow, having high electric bills covered by these low-income residents because of possibly unplanned for rates given high need for electricity if there is not an option and a competition with a robust, creative, domestic, natural gas industry. I wonder whether anybody in that group or anyone else has considered those matters. 
And furthermore, on a more global scale, something that we making decisions here in our local area need to keep in mind is that the global nature of greenhouse gas emissions really are not affected by us, given the fact that we live in uh, the United States and countries that are much more aggressive, like China, for example, don't give concern to things like natural gas emissions and to greenhouse gases. And therefore, our situation in our country is going to be very uh, damaged and greenhouse gases are not going to be affected at all. Even very recently during the Trump administration, the United States was able to export energy sources, including natural gas, which had huge benefits to the whole world, including the national security of our nation. And uh, we unfortunately now are back into a situation where we are not in that position. In Europe, our allies and our friends there currently rely on Russia to supply their natural gas. And of course, we know that this is a untenable, possibly a very unstable situation because Russia may decide, as it has in the past, to just cut off the flow during the winter. We, as Americans, it has been demonstrated, can become both ener energy independent, using and including natural gas, stop being dependent on OPEC, and furthermore, help our own security and the security of the world. I encourage the city of Thousand Oaks to take a broad view of this issue and to not look narrowly at issues that we cannot control. Thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dan Twed, followed by Vadim Mansos. Good evening, Madam Mayor de la Pena, city council members and staff. My name is Dan Tweed, and I live in the wonderful Shadow Oaks neighborhood of Thousand Oaks. And I'm glad to be participating here tonight. A couple items I wanted to bring to your attention, one of which is the upcoming 29th annual Rotary Club Street Fair. And that's just 19 days away. It'll be um, Sunday, October 17th from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. So save the date there. It's uh, Moore Park Road between Hillcrest and Wilbur. Um, I'm going to have a booth next to the Conejo Valley Makers, uh, SW17 by Jack in the Box. But I hope everyone everyone that goes visits all the, the unique booths and uh, really want to uh, show some appreciation to the Thousand Oaks Rotary Club for putting that on for 29 years. And I hope we can even get a street fair going on a more frequent schedule. Um, the other uh, item is kind of a congratulatory uh, shout out to a local company that recently won a NASA million dollar um, CO2 conversion challenge. And uh, that company is Hago Energetics Incorporated right here in Thousand Oaks. And uh, it's a technology that they're using. Uh, they've, they've developed to convert carbon dioxide into sugar. It would be applicable to um, Mars missions. But uh, we need to aggressively attack the climate problem. And it's probably going to involve some uh, direct air capture and uh, ocean that removal. Because uh, if we don't... Uh, have a way to go carbon negative, then um, we're going to have uh, bad uh, circumstances resulting from all the emitted carbon. So uh, big, big uh, supporter of uh, active carbon removal from the atmosphere. Um, in fact, there that same company is also in the uh, $100 million giga scale carbon removal X prize. So um, I think I've, I've got an entry in that too that's kind of a little bit dormant, but uh, I just, uh, I'm gonna be on a discussion panel tomorrow, actually, uh, and the subject is climate technology, the World Talent Economy Forum. Um, very privileged to be on their board of advisors and they have some great uh, speakers. Uh, they've done over 375 uh, shows. So that's worth looking up on, on YouTube, the World Talent Economy Forum, and they're based in Malaysia, but they really do a great job of presenting to a worldwide audience on worldwide issues. 
So uh, save the date for the street fair. Uh, there's still booths available. I think they're only 63% sold out. And uh, I think August, October 10th will be the deadline. And uh, thanks for letting me present tonight. Thanks. Thank you. Next speaker, Vadi Mansos, and our last public speaker is Dennis Medic. Good evening. Um, can you hear me well? Yes. Oh, great. Um, um, my name is Vadi Mansos, and I lived in Newbury Park since 2002 with my family and six children. And um, also, I was really concerned about the uh, greenhouse gas coalition last month i believe in august 31st asked the council to require all new construction and remodeling in our city be entirely electric and and uh, <laughs> you know G governor newsom says that the forest fires and wildfires in california are due to climate change and it's just it's not a st correct statement because i personally like hiking and fishing and Sierras, and I, I know how years back it was well managed. And uh, just a few years back, I think it's 2017, I went to, to see George Bush tree with one of visitors from Ukraine. And then I seen big difference in forest management. And actually, uh, you know, the, my guest <laughs> was asking me about, you know, possible fires and I said yeah lately it happens because look look what's happening and unfortunately our government doesn't probably have an idea that nature is doing what it does best it burns the overgrown overgrowth and clears the forest with the wildfires well and yet the climate change coalition is telling us that switching from natural gas to electric homes will stop for fire uh, you know, forest fires and wildfires man strangely enough it ignores all the facts and, it, and it's utter nonsense and if our government is serious about climate change that what needs to happen is that the state must change its policies about forest management and re return to doing what works best and stop blaming climate change for wildfires. And um, also, I think that uh, in this case, uh, it will give uh, you know monopoly to Edison. And that's why I urge the city council to take a clear eyed view of the situation and resist proposal that infringe upon our daily lives while doing nothing to address the underlying problem. Thank you. Yeah, what's up? Thank you. Our last speaker is Dennis Maddock. Are you on the road? Or how much longer? We're waiting for Dennis Maddock. You're right. we can hear you. Good, good to catch up. Bye. Hello, is this Dennis? Hello, this is Dennis. Can you hear me? Yeah, we heard your previous conversation too. I'm sorry, I wasn't expecting that to happen. You know, that's what happens when you have six kids, even though they're all off my payroll. I wanted to uh, do a shout out to Ed Jones. Um, I uh, hired your daughter in the 70s to work for me when I had a company called Silicon Detector Corporation. I hope she's doing fine. And uh, I've lived in and around the Caneo Valley for most of my life. I was raised in Calabasas. I currently live in Wildwood. And I'm primarily here discussing the issues of greenhouse gases, climate change, uh, and in particular, the Greenhouse Gas Coalition. And uh, I'm a scientist and engineer. I've studied climate change. Uh, for those that are listening and those that are on the panel, uh, you've been duped. Many of the scientists did faulty data analysis years ago. It's being uh, programmed into you, and it's propaganda. So I hate to see our illustrious city council uh, react to that. The Greenhouse Gas Coalition is a small group of people who have a dream 
that the entire world will move into all electric housing and uh, heating our homes, driving our cars and all that. I guess they aren't quite sure how you generate that electricity. There's no way they'll ever generate enough electricity either with solar that kills our environment um, or solar systems. My whole life has been devoted to solar detection and solar and infrared and near infrared and UV, which is a lot in the sun, generates. It is not possible to get enough solar panels from China, because we can't build them here, or the rare earths to make those happen to ever power the economy of the United States. It's totally single-sided and a hoax. Uh, this is not looking forward thinking for a city the size of Thousand Oaks. Uh, it is an unsound practice to think that you're going to do this, and it's a misguided move. Uh, we could essentially mess up our entire economy, economically, tax base, and all that. You should be concerned that a large percentage of people are moving out of the state of California, out of Thousand Oaks, because of all the taxation, the demand for global warming, and all the harassment they get currently from Sacramento. Please don't let that filter down to Thousand Oaks. Uh, I would hate to see that happen. Um, no one should take our rights away on how we heat our house or drive our co cars um, or how we cook our food. It's just really unacceptable. This coalition of people happen to be well-organized group of activists, the same activists that are teaching our kids critical race theory to hate America. And it's a very vocal and it's an international group all tied to climate change. I'm sorry, your time is up now. Thank you very much, Mr. Maddock. Thank you. Bye. Have a good evening. All right. Uh, that concludes public comments. We will now move on to the consent calendar. Adam only, Mayor. Yes, uh, Mr. Jones. Yeah, the consent calendar is very sparse tonight. Mm -hmm. And uh, if no one has any uh, questions, I would like to move uh, that we approve the consent calendar. Okay, let me see. I do have a hand up from someone. Was that you, Mr. Jones, that had a hand up? No, I, I don't have a hand up. No, I don't. I can't hear you, Madam Mayor. Oh, it's from an attendee. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, we have a motion on the floor to approve the consent calendar. Please vote. Councilmember Adam? Yes. Councilmember Jones? Aye. Councilmember McNamee? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Engler? Yes. And Mayor Bill De La Pena? Yes. And Madam Mayor, that motion carries 5-0. Thank you. We will now move to item number 10. It is a report, department report about the Conejo Creek Southwest Park development capital improvements, and that will be presented by Mr. Ryan Roman and Andrew Mooney from CRPD as well. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor Bill De La Pena and City Council members. Thank you so much for having me. Just bear with me while I share my screen here. Okay, can you see that? Yes. Okay, thank you so much for confirming. So I'm here tonight with Andrew Mooney, CRPD Senior Park Planner, to present the Conejo Creek Southwest Park Development Project and propose grant agreement. A quick overview of what we'll be discussing this evening. Uh, we'll be, provide a brief project background, the project description and location, the estimated construction timeline, and the grant agreement recommendation. As you know, the city and CRPD have a longstanding partnership in providing parks and recreation amenities to the Thousand Oaks community. Recent grant agreements and examples of this partnership include the Sockwee Trails Community Park, 
and the team and Global Center upgrades. Just personally, I've had the privilege of working with CRPD staff on a few of these agreements, and I always feel incredibly lucky to be part of this partnership. So Andrew Mooney will provide additional detail on the project background shortly, but just as a reminder to council, this project was included in CRPD's master plan and received a community outreach process. In January 2018, CRPD held an open community meeting to confirm the direction of the park. Madam so Mayor, if I could just ask our presenter, Mr. Roman, to put his PowerPoint and power, uh, presentation mode, please. Did you hear that? Yes. Okay. Um, Mr. Roman, if you could just put it in PowerPoint presentation, because we also see your script. Uh, there you go. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, yes. And uh, so... In January 2018, CRPD held an open community meeting to confirm the direction of the park and solicit feedback from the public. Because of those comments, certain park amenities were incorporated in the proposed project brought for you tonight. A few, uh, a few key dates in the project process. On June 24, 2019, the project was approved by the Thousand Oaks Planning Commission. Then the project was included in the city's adopted fiscal year 21-22 CIP budget with a $1.5 million grant toward the development of the construction of the project. Most recently, the concept plan was reviewed by the Capital Facilities Committee on September 8th, 2021. Here's a bird's eye view of the project area, which the site is located on Page Lane, north of Combs Avenue and west of the 23 freeway. The picture in this slide outlines the currently vacant land where the park will be located. The park would serve the residential community directly adjacent to the property and the nearby growing residence <laughs> on Thousand Oaks Boulevard and the surrounding area. CRPD owns the land and will manage the construction project as well as any future operating and maintenance costs. Now I'd like to turn it over to Andrew Mooney who will provide additional detail on the project and describe some of the amenities in the plan you see before you on the screen. Thank you, Ryan and, and city staff and council. Uh, CRPD really appreciates the opportunity to be here tonight. Um, this is an exciting project for us. Um, this will be a long time coming as far as the master plan of Canal Creek Complex um, to develop this park site. This is one of the remaining few um, properties within that complex of, of the Canal Creek master plan. Um, this project is going to fulfill some deficient parklands that we have as a district, um, as well as provide for, so existing neighborhood use, but then also future neighborhood use, right? So just south of this is the Thousand Oaks Boulevard. And so as you guys are aware, uh, development's happening along that corridor. Um, so again, the, the support that, that Ryan's mentioned in past and present has been tremendous fr from the city. CRPD really appreciates that. Um, and this grant really is going to make that happen. So that, that's helping this park happen now versus possibly years from now. So a district and community really, really appreciates the importance, importance of this for the current and future residents. Um, to kind of give you a project overview of the design, um, it's a 14 acre uh, overall property site. Um, so it's, it, it is split in half by page land. So there's roughly about seven acres on the east side as well as the west side. Um, for the most part, a, a lot of the development of, of developed park space as far as parking lot, uh, solar powered restroom, um, some picnic areas as well as a playground and some courts. We have a sand volleyball and a basketball court. Those are on the east side of the, prop of the property um, as well as we have a network of multi-use pathways and trails as well as a designated equestrian trail that loops around the whole property, but it also connects to an existing city bikeway um, and equestrian trail that this is actually the, the beginning of it to the south and runs all the way through the complex, which connects to um, Canal Creek North, uh, the teen center, the adult center, as well as the, the city library that's on the uh, Canal Creek North uh, park property. Um, so again, really great project. Um, kind of typical approach that we have. You can kind of see from the from the aerial on the site plan you're looking at. Um, we do have a lot of ex existing trees. So we're, we're saving every existing tree 
that's on the property. So we, we've built around that as well as we're adding over 150 trees. So we'll have 150 trees planted as part of this project. Included in those 150 trees, we'll have 27 mitigated walnut trees that, that were came, came up from the 299 Teal Boulevard development. Um, so we've been working closely with uh, city planning staff um, in, their, in their reviews and, and working with private developers. And basically, if, if they don't have room to mitigate on their property, we've, we've welcomed it to be able to incorporate into uh, the park system. And that way, again, the general, general benefit goes to the public. Um, so that way, for, for many years, as those trees grow, people will be able to enjoy it. Um, it included also in this project, this is a 14 acre, uh, 14 acre uh, parcel. We actually only have three acres of turf. However, we've kind of maximized those three acres of turf. Um, CRPD, like most of Southern California in the city, obviously has, has had to deal with the drought. So we've, we've incorporated drought tolerant landscaping, very efficient uh, irrigation to kind of keep all of that, that plant material healthy and growing. However, really looking at water as that resource and to conserve it and use it as efficiently as possible. Um, as well as a part of the project, we're looking at some opportunities um, to be reviewed for dual language. So like English and Spanish language within the playground as well as possibly the uh, park ordinance signs. Um, and then overall kind of um, workability or usability of the park site is the goal is neighborhood parks are walkable. Um, so this, there's a lot of residential all around this park site. So it's actually, it's, it's been sited uh, very well and there, there'll be folks being able to walk here very easily to get to, get to the park. However, those that do wanna drive, there'll be a parking lot. Um, and, and as far as timing goes, we are looking to start construction in October, uh, as well as we are looking at doing a, a groundbreaking and that's on October 23rd, it's a Saturday. So we'll be, we're inviting city council and staff um, to that as well as the public. Um, and then we're looking at hopefully late spring, early summer would be when we would be able to open it. So we, we do have a, a bit of work to do on, on the 14 acres, um, but we, we plan to get moving on it as soon as we can. Um, and so with that, basically th thank you for, for the city's past and past and present financial support and uh, the much needed park for the community. And, and we really appreciate the help. So with that, I'm, I'm available for questions. Thank you very much. I believe we also have the general manager, Jim Friedel here with the park district. Not sure if you wanted to say a few words as well. Okay. Well, uh, I actually was for questions only, but since I appear to have the floor, I wanted to just express my great appreciation to the city council for uh, considering this grant for all of the great works we've done over the years. So other than that, Andrew Mooney is a great planner for the park district and he's our guy. Thank you. All right, now to my council colleagues. Do you have any questions or comments? And if we could get out of the PowerPoint presentation, that'd be great this way I can see everyone. Of All right. Course. Thank you so much for the presentation. This is exciting. And the first one with his hand up, thanks to a new computer that I can now see who is first, is uh, Bob Engler, Mayor Pro Tem Bob Engler, followed by Kevin McNamee. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I just wanted to uh, reiterate what uh, Mr. Friedel had said. Uh, really happy to have this uh, partnership with the Recreation and Parks District uh, that we can um, be assured that there'll be a quality park put in that area that'll serve not only that neighborhood, but also the coming neighborhoods that are being uh, put into our downtown area. Um, I, I read, I think, in the um, staff report that this is going to have a two mash uh, theme to honor our uh, former residents of the area. Is that, uh, is that correct? Correct. Yeah, we'll, we'll have a, a canoe as well as, as well as a hut. And I'm not going to butcher uh, how you say that in Chumash and the terminology, but, um, and then some, some kind of fun play with the, with the Creek, with the Creek theme of, of the playground for, to honor the, honor the Chumash. 
Very good. I think uh, that that co covers a few boxes there that I, I really wanted to see happen and uh, appreciate the hard work you're doing. Thank you. Next, we have Council Member McNamee and then Council Member Jones. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. I have a question for you regarding the equestrian side of the uh, component here, or the uh, element. Uh, given that I've enjoyed horseback riding for many years, uh, I noticed if you'd bring the map up on the uh, north side, I noticed the equestrian tail ends and doesn't allow for crossing over the road to tie in with the others as well as how to get on the trail from uh, further up the map. If you can bring that up, I can point out where I'm referring and to see if we can tie that in to the other trails so that way they're not going over the grass and or uh, destroying some of the shrubbery that's there. Yes. Yeah, no. so we, but east and west, both parcels um, have can access. Can you bring us up a little bit larger? Uh, I'm not seeing it as well. Which view are we in? Yeah, Ryan, you're you're, you're still in for in the we can see your notes still. And Brian, as you stumble through this, I am learning from you so that way I can learn more about PowerPoint. Thank you for doing <laughs> Thank you. No matter how much you practice, of course, then then the screen switches on you, right? Are you able to see that? Uh it, you're still in the uh presentation mode, but uh or uh, the um uh presenter view, but that's okay. Uh if you look at, if you click off of the display settings and um, allow for me to point out where we're discussing, because it's up a little bit higher than where you are right now, are you able to go into presenter view? Yeah, just let me, uh, one sec here. Yeah, yep. Yeah. All right, are you are you seeing that? No, you have to go to display settings and then uh, switch view. Scroll right. down, hit display settings again, and you have to click on the first one down. There we go. All right, so see page lane at the very top of the page, and correct me if I'm wrong, the brownish roads there on the left and right side of the top part of the page, those are the equestrian trails, correct? Correct. All right, you notice that both of them have no entrance or exit or, or, or recycling with the rest of the trails, specifically the one on the top left going, it could go across page lane and then dovetail down into the one on the right side of page lane and be a continuous loop. So that way they're not having to destroy the uh, foliage that may be there. Do you follow? So, where so, so the existing city bikeway actually has an equestrian uh, trail on the shoulder of it. Mm -hmm. And they actually have uh, scored concrete crossing in the bike lane in that area. And so basically where we would be kind of, I'd say restoring, but, but uh, kind of grading native and keeping it clear with the development of the park. Um, and so then that would tie in and we would have multiple kind of concrete crossings as we would uh, go across pedestrian pathways. And basically we're connect, we're, we're kind of at the terminus of the trail. And so we're connecting to the existing um, city bikeway and equestrian trail. If you could look at number two for me and move the pointer up over there and make sure we're talking about the same place. Number two, go to the right just slightly. That's the bike lane, correct? And if you come correct. down a little bit, the brown is the equestrian trail, right? Correct, and that's question, existing. Correct, and my question or request is tying that in with number nine across the road so that way it doesn't, as you take the horse from number nine to number two or number two to number nine, you're not destroying the shrubbery and that it's a nice trail to go across uh, to those two locations. Does that make sense to you? Correct. Um, in discussions with C City Public Works Department, we aren't having any crossings going across Page Lane um, due, due to traffic and curvature of the road there. We actually shifted our parking lot for vehicle traffic um, to be in a proper location per the traffic engineering studies. So with that, the goal is to not direct traffic across page lane, because that would be an unsafe crossing because of the curvature and the speed of the road there. And we would be directing um, folks, uh, whether horseback or bike, down the bike trail to um, the southern, it would be like the bottom left corner of the site plan. And then they would, if they wanted to continue riding, they would ride across page, across the asphalt, across page lane 
to the east property and they can do a full loop on that property. However, we do have a shoulder that we would connect to if, if folks on the, it would be on the east side of the 23, but south side of Page Lane before you get to Canada Creek South Ballfield. Um, if they would be riding their horses out, they could ride on the south shoulder, shoulder of Page Lane so they don't have to cross Page Lane and connect into the east property of, of the park site. Okay, I, I follow what you're saying. And I see on like number seven where your icon is right now that yes, they can cross there because you've got a good line of sight to protect the horse and rider as well as the vehicle. Uh, but I'm sure as the mayor will uh, confirm with me, horses are capable of going to quite a few, uh, ter- going through quite a few uh, different terrains. And I can assure you that equestrian riders at number two will try to cross the road up there. And that may need to be addressed at some point to either set it up differently so they have a better line of sight and can cross there. Because whether you put something across or not, they will try to cross there. Just want to share that warning with you that that will happen. And part part of the park development is we're actually putting a a split rail fence on either side of Page Lane to to protect the public and to direct them into the Combs and, and Page Lane intersection. Excellent, thank you. Mr. Jones. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Yeah, Madam Mayor, I I just like to compliment uh, Jim and Andrew for the presentation and for the development of this part. Uh, This may be the culmination of this sort of thing. I'm not aware of other uh, large uh, areas of land that, you know, might be treated this way. But let me say that going back to the early days of our city, we worked with both the park district and the school district uh, demanding that developers, when they develop their track, donate a certain amount of land. They didn't like it. But when we made the early ones do it, then <laughs> the ones that followed had the uh, idea that, well, you did it. To, uh, to, I mean, the ones that watched the people that came later said, well, you made us do it, so you've got to make them do it, too. As a result, we have an awful lot of land. We have over 50 parks, and uh, Tex Ford before, and then Jim now have uh, really done well with the uh, finances of the district, when we have, I think, between three and 4,000 programs. My point is that this is really a success story for the city of Thousand Oaks and for our people. Beginning when I moved here in 64, the only park, excuse me, that the district owned was a Stella Park, which is I think less than half an acre next to the the land that we're looking forward to putting some affordable housing in at Herbs and Hillcrest. And from that tiny beginning, because of the partnership, among all three, the city, the park district, and the school district. We've had lovely locations for schools, and we've had, as I say, over 50 parks, including large community parks and large play fields and and, and just, you know, dozens and dozens of neighborhood parks. So uh, sorry about the long uh, oration here, but this may be the culmination. I don't know if there's any more land that might profit this way. But uh, the city, beginning with the early days and culminating now with our excellent uh, city manager, Drew, have uh, guided us to you know, continue this and further the development. And I don't know of any other city anywhere that has the great combination of city, park district, and school district that we have. And then one last thing, uh, I don't know if anybody's aware of it, but the uh, in the National League of Parks, and I don't know, Jim, you can fill me in on the date, but about seven or eight years ago, they voted for the whole country that the Canaveral Park District was one of the top four uh, park districts in the whole country. So I'm so glad we can do this tonight. Thank you. Thank you. I have a quick question for Mr. Mooney. Uh, when you design parks, and now in particular this one, that includes equestrian trails, I would imagine that you do 
perhaps seek the feedback of equestrians or the neighbors nearby when you put this together? Yes, de definitely. One, one of the reasons why we put in the equestrian trail element of this park is because of the neighbors. And so when we held when we held community meetings and got feedback from folks who who heard about the the interest of the district looking to develop it, um, as well as we have uh, multiple uh, equestrian um, user groups like ETI, um, Ride On. Um, and so we we look to their resources as well as resources from the general public on how 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 they how they use their horses and how they use our parks with their horses. Good. Okay. So this has been vetted by equestrians then. Correct. Right. Thank you. All right. And with that, I do now see Mr. Adam with a hand up. I'm imagining it's for a motion, but go ahead. You have a good imagination, Mayor. That's exactly <laughs> right. And. Uh, Correct me if I'm wrong, I see Jim on the screen there. And Ed, I think we actually have over 60 parks, don't we, don't we Jim? Yeah, I mean, we uh, we always say over 50, <laughs> a lot. up to 60, because uh, it gets into the weeds on definition. But, you know, is CLU pool a park or not? Or, you know, that kind of stuff. So, but yeah, we have, a, we have, a, we have more than 60 different facilities, yeah. most of which are parks. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, our park system and our Canada Rec and Park District are really second to none in California or in the entire country, like Ed said. It's just incredible what we've been able to do over the years. And there's so much to like about this project. I like the fact that it's low impact, not a lot of asphalt, but you got a lot of green, equestrian tra trails, walkability, connected to the boulevard where our general plan update is calling for a little more residential there. I think that's important. We get our Walnut Grove uh, uh, moved over a little bit to this park with 27 trees, so it's all good. Like I said, a lot to like, and it really fits well with what's there now. So uh, I would like to make a motion that we uh, proudly, as a city, contribute to this great resource. Move 10A. Excellent. 10A has recommendation one and two. Yes, Mr. Adam? One and two. That is correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, yes, I love the fact that... Uh, here it is 2021 and we still construct parks with the heritage of our community in mind namely the Shumash as well as our equestrian heritage so I believe that that is worth noting thank you and I will call for a vote Councilmember Adam yes Councilmember Jones aye Councilmember McNamee yes Mayor Pro Tem Angler yes and Mayor Bill De La Pena yes and that motion carries 5-0. Thank you very much. We now move to item 13, which is council issues recommendations. And this one really is a historic consideration this evening. We are going to be considering whether to approve an emergency shelter and permanent supportive housing in the city of Thousand Oaks, the first time ever. This report was put together by staff, but it is from the ad hoc committee uh, on homelessness, namely Mayor Pro Tem Bob Engler and myself. This has been three years in the making and uh, very well, um, I'm actually quite proud that we finally got to this point this evening and uh, wanted to also let Mayor Pro Tem Engler say a few words as the co-committee member of the Ad Hoc uh, Homelessness Committee. Thank you, uh, Mayor. Um, yes, I'm very also very happy. The, the committee has been working hard for the last uh, several years and the the a uh, number of things we've looked at and examined while all the while while our our unhoused population uh, is growing um i think the the solutions that we are bringing to our to our colleagues i think are worthy of debate and worthy of uh, taking a look at um i uh i'm looking forward to our discussion tonight as am i and with that i will now turn it over to well, is it Ingrid Hardy, uh, our assistant city manager, or is it Mike Powers with the uh, County of Ventura, the chief executive officer of the <laughs> County of Ventura? Good evening, Mr. Powers. Madam Mayor, we're going to have Mike uh, Mike Powers make some uh, a couple of uh, opening remarks for you before Ingrid takes over. Yes, thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Powers. All right. 
Thank you, Drew. And, and thank you, Mayor Della Pena, Bill Della Pena, council members, Mr. Powers and Ms. Noonan. Um, really excited to be with you here tonight and just want to start off by thanking you for your leadership uh, in bringing this uh, this project forward for a permanent shelter and for and to develop permanent supportive housing. And just to lay a little foundation, a little, a little background, uh, I really want to thank you also for uh, agreeing to and signing the countywide homeless MOU. And basically what that does, as you know, is it says it agrees that all the cities in the county will work together. You'll work in your own communities to support the unhoused. And we'll also agree to cooperate and coordinate with a single point of entry for anyone who needs housing. And we'll all use the same information system, one information system for all providers, over 30 different providers. And I think that's just a great example of the city and the counties, uh, county and the cities working together. We've also got the Continuum of Care Board. That's where the county and the cities, area housing authorities, community-based providers, private sector business, and most importantly, a woman with lived experience, uh, work together to, to decide how best to use funding. And this is really revolutionary. This has happened in about the last eight years, and it works really well. And what, one of the best results of it is that we, we all agree to dedicate the funding, to allocate funding to those programs that are proven to work most effectively. And we can see more clearly now than we ever have before what we have in the continuum of care and what we don't, where the gaps are. So I've been working in this area one way or another in different roles for over 20 years. I've never seen this amount of cooperation and coordination amongst city, county, and community partners. And so I think it's just a really special uh, time uh, that you have before you tonight. Uh, our county, our board of supervisors, our chair parks, I believe uh, may be joining us tonight. They've committed uh, to support permanent year-round shelter efforts. They've committed to funding funding a match of ongoing uh, operating costs, as well as to provide uh, wraparound services. And the other thing I would say is uh, these, the availability of these home key funds from the state, it's really a once in a generation opportunity. Uh, and you know, you really got to, I think there's three things. You, you got to plan, collaborate, and move quickly. Because it's not going to be there long. There's going to be a lot of demand for it. And uh, But it can happen. And the stars are aligning for, for the city of Thousand Oaks. And it's not just nice words, because we've seen it happen in Oxnard, in the city of Oxnard. We partnered with them. We had to move quickly. We had a good developer, strong developer. And it happened. And now they have over 70 units of permanent supportive housing there uh, because everybody got on the same page and worked well together. The other reason I think is an important moment in time is the county and community organizations have really, especially over the last 10 years, built so many community-based programs, health, social services, uh, mental health, alcohol and drug uh, programs that where we go out into the field to support the people facing homelessness. We have more of this than ever, and it's really proving effective. But time after time, one of the things these wonderful people, these passionate people say is, we need housing for all of the service programs that we have. Still finding placement for them is our biggest challenge and we need permanent supportive housing. So that's one of the things that the continuum of care has highlighted. Uh, all of our programs are highlighting. And of course the folks who are placed in this permanent supportive housing will be placed through the single point of entry program and information will be shared and coordinated with all the providers through the HMIS system. And we're, data is critical, right? Data will really lead you in the right path. And one of the things that we've seen is a strong retention rate in housing. Greater than 96% of folks are still housed two years later. So proven incredibly effective. So emergency shelter programs are, are really effective at stabilizing people you know, who are facing the trauma of being unhoused. But you have to be able to transition them as well next into permanent supportive housing. And that's what you're talking about doing here tonight. And uh, I just thank you for your leadership. And the goal is to obtain, of course, uh, permanent housing options for people. And that's the opportunity you have before you tonight. So I just thank you for your leadership and your partnership. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Powers. I appreciate your time this evening because I know you are a very, very busy man. <laughs> so you. very Honored much appreciated. And with that, we will go to our assistant city manager, Ingrid Hardy, who has really embraced this issue for um, since the day she started almost. Go ahead. Okay. All right, there we go. Good evening, Madam Mayor and members of the city council. 
I'm here tonight as a follow-up to the update that was provided by the ad hoc committee in June of 2018. I'm sorry, June of this past year. Addressing homelessness has been a city council priority since 2018 when the ad hoc committee was formed. The committee members spent a significant amount of time learning the landscape of homelessness in Thousand Oaks from a wide range of stakeholders with significant on the ground experience. Recognizing the complexity of this crisis, the city committed to serving as a convener between county agencies, residents, businesses, nonprofit organizations, the faith community, and the law and law enforcement in responding to homelessness. Oftentimes, homelessness is characterized one dimensionally. However, homelessness afflicts a variety of demographic categories, can be attributed to a range of factors and or a combination of factors, and can present itself in many forms. According to the National Coalition for the Homeless, the leading causes of homelessness include lack of affordable housing, poverty, unaffordable health care, domestic violence, mental illness, and addiction. Additionally, we know that locally, inadequate retirement and youth transitioning out of foster care are also contributors to homelessness. Homelessness can be categorized into four types and factors contributing to each type of uh, experience can vary. Chronic homelessness is characterized by individuals, usually with a disabling condition, who have been continuously homeless for one year or more, or have had four or more episodes of homelessness in the past three years. Typically, these individuals are older, they have complex long-term health issues, and often live in a street, in a, on the street, in a car, park, or other location that is not suitable for human habitation. Episodic homelessness refers to individuals who are currently homeless and have experienced at least three episodes of homelessness in the previous year. These individuals also suffer from some type of disabling conditions such as medical problems, mental illness, and or substance addiction issues. Transitional homelessness is actually the most common type and is often attributed to a recent catastrophic event or sudden life change. And lastly, there's hidden homelessness, which refers to individuals temporarily living with others or couch surfing without a guarantee that they will be able to stay long-term and without immediate prospects for acquiring permanent housing. This often describes people staying with friends or relatives because they lack other housing opportunities. This population is considered hidden because they do not access homeless support and services despite their need for them. For this reason, they do not appear in our standard homeless statistics. Again, homelessness presents itself in many forms and some experience long-term homelessness while others experience it for shorter periods. To address the various contributing factors to homelessness and the types of homelessness, experts show that a multi-pronged approach is the most effective means in addressing it. These are five components of a homelessness crisis response system. The goal of this system is to make homeless rare, brief, and non-recurring. An effective crisis system identifies and quickly connects people who are experiencing or at risk of experiencing homelessness to housing assistance and other services. Each component could include the participation of one or more agencies, organizations, or institutions. As the local convener, the city works with multiple agencies and organizations to respond to the needs of persons experiencing homelessness in Thousand Oaks. However, the city continues to be hindered in its ability to sufficiently serve our unhoused population due to a lack of emergency shelter and available permanent supportive housing. And I'll touch more upon this later in the presentation. In 2018, the City Council's Ad Hoc Committee on Homelessness presented several areas of focus to develop and strengthen the city's response to homelessness. These categorical recommendations include aligning the city strategies with a broader regional approach, 
developing robust education and outreach materials, continuing to fund local service providers through our CDBG and Social Services Endowment Fund, maintaining public spaces and facilities, encouraging the inclusion of additional affordable housing units and future residential projects, and also taking necessary administrative actions to strengthen the city's response. And last but certainly not least, supporting and working with our law enforcement to address public safety issues and concerns related to homelessness. In accordance with the recommended focus areas, the city council has taken meaningful action over the last few years. And some of these actions are summarized on the slide. As mentioned by our county CEO, Mike Powers, the city council did approve a countywide MOU with other local cities. The MOU calls for a joint commitment to address homelessness through actions such as participating in our coordinated entry system and developing our crisis response system. The city also solicited feedback in our last statistically valid survey. And in this survey, 60% of respondents support incentivizing hotels to accept vouchers, 62% support temporary shelter, and 59% support permanent supportive housing. Additionally, to build awareness of um, homelessness in Thousand Oaks, we've consolidated information on the city's website, We've conducted a robust um, outreach campaign on giving to local organizations instead of panhandlers. In addition, the ad hoc committee hosted a well attended symposium with representatives from our local faith community, um, state and county government, as well as law enforcement. Um, City Council has approved over $800,000 to our nonprofits. We have a dedicated staff resource. After the Boise ruling, which I'll touch upon a little bit later, the city updated its municipal code to distinguish between sleeping versus camping. We have participated in multi-jurisdictional agency meetings to respond to our encampments. The city council has also encouraged the inclusion of affordable housing units in residential projects. And this has resulted in over 150 units being identified through a pre-screen process. And lastly, the city council recently approved the acquisition of Hillcrest Christian School, which will be the future site of for sale affordable housing. The ad hoc committee last presented to the city council on June 22nd of this year. That update highlighted some of the information already recapped tonight, but also went into more detail regarding the local homelessness landscape, challenges and opportunities, and the city's efforts to date. It's important to revisit some of the facts and figures regarding persons experiencing homelessness in Thousand Oaks. As discussed previously, um, the city uh, there was a point in time homeless count conducted in 2020, and this is a federal mandate and is used to allocate state funding. By HUD's definition, the count includes persons who are an emergency shelter or a motel paid for by a program, those that are in transitional housing or living in places not meant for human habitation. While an important survey tool, the point in time count methodology notoriously undercounts the homeless. The survey does not include individuals who are living with family and friends or paying for their own motel room, those that may be at risk of homelessness or persons in institutions. It also only provides a snapshot of homelessness in a given place on a single night. It doesn't take into account persons experiencing episodic homelessness or hidden homelessness that we discussed earlier. Our local police department and, um, not only participates in the um, point in time count, but they also conduct their own count on an annual basis. And this provides us with a more accurate count of um, the number of persons experiencing homelessness in Thousand Oaks. In 2020, the count was 242 individuals. 
This number is approximately 59% higher than the point in time count. And of the 242 persons experiencing homelessness, our police department reports that approximately 80% of these individuals are from Thousand Oaks or have ties to Thousand Oaks. Um, this pie chart provides the age demographics of our homeless population in Thousand Oaks, which for the most part is distributedly evenly across most age groups. On the right is a table containing subpopulation data for persons experiencing homelessness in, in Thousand Oaks. The subpopulation data is self-reported and an individual can fall under multiple categories. For example, they can report that they're first time homeless and they have a physical disability. The number of persons experiencing homelessness for the first time continues to be the highest number for the second year in a row. This is partially due to a need for more prevention resources, the high cost of housing and the low number of available or alternate housing options um, continue to be a tipping point leading individuals to experience homelessness for the first time. This slide depicts the percentage of where homeless persons are located in Thousand Oaks, including changes that occurred between 2019 and 2020. The number of persons living in encampments has increased significantly over the last year. These individuals now make up 41% of persons experiencing homelessness in Thousand Oaks. The, propor the proportion in hotels has also increased, and this is likely due to the state's Project Room Key program and council providing local nonprofits with funding for motel vouchers since the rotating winter shelter was closed um, in 2020 due to um, COVID. At our June 22nd meeting, we also discussed some of the ongoing challenges. The Martin versus Boise ruling essentially states that it is cruel and unusual punishment for municipalities to criminalize the act of sleeping outside when there is no sleeping space available in a shelter. As a result, ordinances that ban or prohibit the act of sleeping on public property when an individual has no other option is considered unconstitutional. The city did update its ordinance to differentiate between camping and sleeping, and sleeping is allowed between the hours of 10 p.m. and 6 a.m., according to our ordinance. City staff, council, and TOPD regularly receive complaints from residents and local businesses to do something about our homeless population. Being homeless is not a crime, and there are very limited um, options on the actions that law enforcement can take. In addition, when there is enforcement, there is a challenge with short-term court custody. Um, oftentimes, when a person experiencing homelessness is arrested, they do not stay in custody for very long. Quite often, they are in custody for a few hours and then released. And upon release, they return to the same city and in some cases return to the same place where they were arrested. My apologies, I skipped too fast there. Lastly, there is no year-round emergency shelter available in the Conejo Valley. So for persons who need shelter with services to help them navigate housing options, there's no place for them to go. There are also very few permanent housing resources available locally. City Council has recognized the gap in its crisis response system, and as a result, recently adopted a priority to identify and advance solutions for temporary shelter and permanent supportive housing. Other opportunities include continuing to support local organizations through our grant programs and pursuing funding through um, the federal, state, and county agencies. The June 22nd update to council underscored the city's ongoing need for emergency shelter and permanent supportive housing to more effectively assist members of our community experiencing homelessness. It recalled the city's um, number two priority. And we also noted the city's plan to issue a request for qualifications to identify a highly qualified 
developer, owner, or operator to assist the city in identifying a potential location for acquisition and conversion into an emergency shelter and permanent supportive housing. The intention of issuing the RFQ was to proactively prepare the city for significant anticipated new funding expected to become available through the state's project home key round two. Before we go into the recommendations um, before the city council this evening, I would like to take a step back and provide critical foundational information regarding tonight's proposal. Project Home Key is a statewide effort to sustain and rapidly expand housing for persons experiencing homelessness or at risk of homelessness. The round two of the funding continues to build on the success of both Project Room Key and the first round of Project Home Key. The state has committed approximately $1.45 billion to the program for fiscal year 21-22 and the program will be administered by the California's Housing and Community Development Department. The program will make grant funding available to local public entities, including cities, to acquire and convert existing buildings, including hotels, into permanent or interim housing. The funding can also be used for units to be converted from non-residential to residential, new construction, master leasing of properties, for non-congregate housing or scattered site housing where units are dedicated to the target population. Also, one of the requirements of Project Home Key funding is that applicants must use the Housing First model. Housing First is an evidence-based practice that has demonstrated when persons experiencing homelessness are housed first and offered wraparound services the chances of returning to homelessness is greatly reduced. Due to this successful strategy, in 2016, Housing First was codified in the state's Welfare and Institution Code. California legislature passed Senate Bill 1380 requiring all housing programs to adopt the Housing First model. Tenant screening and selection practices promote accepting applicants regardless of their sobriety or use of substances completion of treatment or participation in services. Also, applicants are not rejected on the basis of poor credit or financial history. Duration or chronicity of homelessness, vulnerability to early mortality, or high utilization of crisis services are also factors in tenant selection. Under the Housing First model, tenants do pay rent and they do have all the rights and responsibilities of tenancy. This slide illustrates some of the primary characteristics of interim shelter and housing and permanent supportive housing. The nomenclature around various housing types to accommodate persons experiencing homelessness is varied. For the purpose of the meeting tonight and to simplify the request before the council, a shelter or interim housing is designed to be temporary. Some shelters are open during the winter only, such as what we had um, with a rotating winter shelter in Thousand Oaks. And then there's also year round shelters such as the um, shelter in Ventura. They are typically operated by nonprofits or religious organizations. And in addition to providing food, the more common and a roof over one's head, the more common model today is one of a navigation center where there's on site case managers who help individuals navigate housing options, employment services, healthcare, and other needs. The ultimate goal is permanent housing and to end homelessness. For some, the pathway to permanent housing may be rapid rehousing where rental assistance is provided to help someone get back on their feet. In other cases, and for persons with disabilities or those that are chronically homeless, a likely pathway is permanent supportive housing. And this is where permanent supportive housing combines affordable housing with wraparound support services. Tenants sign a lease and they pay rent. Over 90% of tenants retain housing and permanently exit homelessness. And this is also considered a less expensive option for addressing unsheltered homelessness. 
The goal is stable long-term housing and a productive life. According to the United States Interagency Council on Homelessness, study after study has shown that supportive housing not only resolves homelessness and increases housing stability, but also improves health and lowers public costs by reducing the use of publicly funded crisis services, including shelters, hospitals, psychiatric centers, jails, and prisons. Now for the outcome of the RFQ. The first team being recommended to partner with the city and the county on Project Home Key is Mini Mansions, Area Housing Authority, and Turning Point Foundation. Permanent supportive housing currently exists in Thousand Oaks. The first motel conversion and permanent supportive housing in Thousand Oaks was built by Mini Mansions. Mini Mansions currently operates 58 supportive housing units locally. They have a deep understanding of the community, its character and the city's development process. They have a large local profile. They operate 18 affordable housing properties in the city alone. Turning Point successfully manages other shelters in the county, including the only 24 seven shelter and service center specializing in adults with mental illness. They have an 85% rate of successful transitions from homelessness to permanent housing through their emergency shelter. And many mansions and Turning Point are already a part of our local coordinated entry system. Many mansions will pursue a site that can accommodate both permanent housing and a small fraction that will be set aside for emergency shelter. This will not be a drop-in facility where persons show up seeking services. Instead, providers will receive referrals through the county's coordinated entry system um, and local providers. The second team being recommended is Shangri-La Industries and Step Up on Second. This team has significant motel conversion experience, including two home key projects. They have a proven record on permanent supportive housing, including being cost effective and timely projects that are delivered, um, timely projects delivered that are responsive to unique community needs and 97% program retention rates. Shangri-La has taken a proactive step by entering into a private transaction with, their pro with the property owner of Quality Inn and Suites. They do not require any capital assistance for acquisition or rehab of the site. Unlike capital projects that are brought before the city council where staff releases an RFP and returns to council with a dollar amount of the project cost, this is not the case for the item before you this evening. Financing affordable and supportive housing projects is very complex and requires an amalgamation of various funding types. And the ability to access these various funding types is dependent upon a host of factors. This is not an exhaustive list of funding sources, but merely for the purpose of demonstrating that the number of funding opportunities the city, county, and respective development partners can pursue. As a reminder, to support the City Council's priority of affordable housing and addressing homelessness, the City Council has already unanimously approved funding in the current fiscal year budget. And, and this amount of funding is $16 million, and there is just over $6 million remaining that can be used to support both of these projects. If the city council chooses to move forward with the recommendations this evening, this will not be the first time that the city is financially contributing to affordable housing in Thousand Oaks. Since 1973, the city has contributed nearly $70 million towards affordable housing units. For the most part, these contributions were made using redevelopment dollars prior to the dissolution of RDA. And this does include over $7 million for Hillcrest Villas, which has units set aside for homeless persons with mental disabilities and their families, as well as units for extremely low income and homeless families. 
After the dissolution of redevelopment, the city's contributions towards affordable housing has been greatly reduced until recently when you acquired the former site of Hillcrest Christian School. While the council is not being asked to appropriate a specific amount of funding this evening, by approving the recommendations before you this evening, you are making an affirmative commitment to provide future funding towards each of these projects. City staff, county staff, and development teams will work cooperatively to identify as many sources of funding as possible to support the project and to bring forth the most reasonable request before the city council at a later date. Staff recognizes that this is a bold recommendation before the city council um, to address your number two priority. However, this is based on unique circumstances. Again, the unprecedented state and federal funding, Shangri-La's ability to leverage private financing and their experience with the first round of Project Home Key, and many mansions is locally known and has a solid reputation and has an experienced partner to operate the shelter and address local temporary housing needs. If approved, city and county staff will continue to flesh out Shangri-La's potential project at the quality and in suites, including feasibility. We will also work with many mansions on identifying a suitable site. And each of these projects will have to come back to the city council where staff will request an appropriation and authorization to apply for Project Home Key. And that concludes my presentation for um, this evening. We do have representatives available um, from the uh, county continuum of care, um, from many mansions, from Turning Point Foundation, Area Housing Authority, Shangri-La Industries, as well as Step Up on Second. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Hardy. Really appreciate this extremely thorough presentation. Uh, it was a, a long presentation, but it was extremely important, and it was really to present the culmination of many years of hard work, with not only behind the scenes, but also with residents. And we do have a long list of speakers this evening regarding this item. And so I would like to ask my council colleagues to perhaps uh, limit your questions. We wanna be fair and respectful of everyone's time. And uh, perhaps we can start out by asking three questions before we move on to the next council member. And uh, with that, I'm looking to see who will have his hand up first, and that is Council Member McNamee, followed by Council Member Engler, and then Mr. Adam. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Finding a solution to that homeless issues that face the state as well as our city is very important to me. That was one of my platform items to find creative solutions to this. I was dropped uh, uh, into this uh, decision last Thursday when I, the agenda was released and I could read the nine page outline. And this is the first I've seen this PowerPoint presented to really take an evaluation of what is being offered here. So three questions isn't gonna make it. I've already got 21 written down. So well, Mr. Mr. McNamee, we can start out with three questions and we can take turns and uh, before we go to the residents because other council members would like to get a chance to speak that as would well. Be just fine. Okay. I'm not sure who to direct this question to, so let me put it out there and see which person staff would like to handle this. My, my, I'm trying to picture how this works as far as Police go to a scene and they find a homeless person that's sleeping there. Do they talk with them and say, you got two choices. You're going to county jail or you're going into transitional housing. And if they go into transitional housing to get the mental health services, the drug rehab, the work training, are they able to freely come in and out of that facility, this case, the uh, Quality Inn? And if they do that, uh, what kind of impact will that have on the community, the business community around with all Thousand Oaks homeless congregating right in that location. I, I don't know who to direct that question to. I'm gonna have our um, law enforcement address the question, but just one point of clarification before I do that, the quality in and suites is being proposed as permanent supportive housing, not as a um, temporary shelter. 
So with that, I will uh, turn the question over to um, Chief Paris and Josh Richter. Good evening. So essentially, can you guys hear me okay? Yes, good evening. Okay. So essentially, to answer your question, sir, um, if I contact somebody that is uh, illegally camping or they're just sleeping on, on the city and then we have a option of going to the uh, going to the shelter that we have in an emergency shelter or moving on. And I know that I have beds available at the shelter. So if this person uh, does refuse to go to the uh, emergency, emergency shelter, then at that point we can at least have the option to enforce uh, uh, legal camping. Um, there are other uh, penal codes such as illegal uh, lodging that we can also potentially use to enforce this, uh, this or get this person um, off the streets. But again, uh, I have to know what uh, beds I have available at that shelter and um, and it and to make sure that the person is is aware that they make sure that they are aware that they have that option of going to the shelter before I can do any enforcement. So let's say that permanent supportive housing that we're proposing here is full and you come upon someone who's camping, then that's off the table as far as taking the county jail for lodging and or uh, drug rehab or whatever the case may be. Is that correct? So the permanent supportive housing doesn't really play in on this, right? This is, we're talking emergency shelter as far as people that are out camping. Um, so right now we, because of Boise uh, v. Martin, we don't have any options right now for enforcement. So this will give us the opportunity to have options for enforcement. Um, so what that's going to look like, we will, you know, still be developing. Remember, Boise v. Martin is only two years old. There's still case law being developed on that. Um, but right now, we really don't have any options for enforcement. This will give us options now to be able to enforce uh, some of the camping laws. Thank you. And for my third question. Just... Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, Ingrid. Go ahead. My apologies, Councilmember McNamee. If I can also just share, too, that um, we can work with our law enforcement team to have beds that are set aside specifically for that purpose. We have seen that done in other communities so that they know they can pick up the phone and um, reach the shelter and have a bed available. So you've made it clear that this is primarily permanent supportive housing and I'm hearing an 85% retention rate years later. What is the plan to get these people independent out of the permanent supportive housing and into their own uh, uh, per, uh, personal housing and not government funded housing. What's the plan? So that's, I think that's going to be dependent upon the unique circumstances of the individuals um, in the housing. And I can certainly have um, someone from, you know, who's more versed and um, has experience um, with this matter to address your question. Um, if I can call upon Todd Lipka. Um, with Step Up on second. And then we also have um, Rick Schroeder available with Mini Mansions, and they can talk about some of the strategies as far as how they work with our, um, our homeless population. So um, I see Todd's on, so we'll just. Mr. Lipka. Todd. Mr. Lipka, followed by Mr. Schrader, and we also have uh, from Shangri-La, uh, Andy Myers, or Meyer. So uh, this is Todd Lipka, the CEO for Step Up. And uh, Councilman, relative to your question, um, in, in, um, in the Assistant City Manager's presentation, she talked about the different types of, uh, uh, of individuals in the homeless population. So for the chronic population who have complex needs of um, mental health issues, maybe physical health issues, addiction issues, with a project like this, permanent supportive housing, the goal is not for them to uh, live for a period of time in these units and then transition out, get a, get a full-time job and uh, become more self-sustaining and independent because they're living with a disability or multiple disabilities. So what we're looking for is for the individual to really stay long-term in these units. And we've done this time and time again. 
And we know the outcomes we're looking for is housing stability. And Step Up has a 97% retention rate. We've done many of these motel projects. We have about eight of them right now. And uh, they, they really do work. And what we know is the outcomes are that these individuals who are on the street, once they move into housing, their reduced interactions with 911 calls, with police, with fire, with going to the ER, with the courts, with the jails, that's all going to be significantly reduced once these individuals move into housing. So the goal for those with the chronic is really to housing retention and their reduced interaction with the most expensive government services, both for the county and the city. To the extent that we house the non-chronic in some of these units, and I think that will be the minority, um, there, there may be a pathway for them moving to uh, more of an individually sustainable housing situation when we provide employment support, educational support, and they can go out and uh, get off public benefits and then earn their own income. But for the vast majority of people we're talking about, because this, this project will go towards uh, a chronic population, it's individuals who will stay there and uh, will do well in supporting their tenancies and reintegrating into their community. Thank you, sir. Who else was going to uh, address this? Or oh, were you satisfied with this answer, Mr. McNamara? Oh, well, yeah, no, uh, Mr. Schroeder was also gonna speak, I believe. Is he on? I don't see him just yet. Okay, well, we can move on to others. I'll come back. Uh, okay. back to the other ones. Oh, I there's have. Mr. Schrader. He's right here. Oh, okay. okay, go ahead, Mr. Schrader. Let me unmute myself. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council. As you may know, Many Mansions is the largest provider of permanent supportive housing, not just in the City of Thousand Oaks, but all of Ventura County. And in Ventura County, all the referrals to permanent supportive housing come through the coordinated entry system. So it's not a case where the sheriff picks up somebody off the street and takes them to permanent supportive housing. It's a very long referral process through the social service agencies to the coordinated entry system. Once they're in the housing, everyone at many mansions permanent supportive housing pays rent. What distinguishes it as permanent supportive housing is that there's the on-site support through our case management staff that work with a resident on job development, substance abuse, mental health counseling. We bring in the behavior, uh, Ventura County Behavioral Health, computer skills, tutoring programs, lots of different things so that they can live a very healthy and productive life. Some of our supportive housing residents do transition to other affordable housing or outside of our system. Um, but like Todd said, most of our supportive housing residents do stay in, in supportive housing. But they all pay rent, and they're all very similar to just like all of our other residents. They have their Excellent. own units, they, they have a lease, everything. Thank you, sir. Madam Mayor, back to you. I'll come back and sir. Thank you so much. Next up, we have Mayor Pro Tem Bob Engler. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Mayor. Um, I think my I just have one quick question, and I'm sure there'll be others later. Um, I wanted, uh, if I could, to have our city attorney Tracy Noonan go a little bit in more into depth on the Boise case and how that affects much of what we do um, uh, in terms of being able to enforce our our ordinances, and also how that also affects um, actions by the county uh, to. Um, uh, incarcerate any, any of the individuals we have? So historically, the city has had, um, most cities have a, a, an illegal camping ordinance. Um, but most of the these ordinance prior to the Boise case didn't really distinguish between the act of sleeping and the act of camping. The Boise case, um, when it was decided, it concluded again, as um, Ms. Hardy indicated, that um, criminalizing the act of sleeping outdoors when a person has no other alternative location to sleep violates the Eighth Amendment um, because they have no other option. Sleeping is a fundamental biological necessity, um, and therefore you cannot. It, it, it's it's there's no you cannot 
criminalize that biological need. What the court did say, though, um, they did you know, indicate that there are limited circumstances where we can prohibit even the act of sleeping in certain locations. So the city redrafted its um, illegal camping ordinance to make clear the difference between sleeping and camping. And we also um, included language in there that prohibits even the act of sleeping in certain locations, primarily our open space locations because of significant wildfire danger, biological habitat um, concerns, et cetera. So it really placed, um, the Boise case really placed um, restrictions on what cities and counties and actually any government agency can do with respect to homeless individuals who have no place to sleep. We have to allow them to sleep on public property. We don't have to allow them to camp, but we do have to allow them to sleep. Um, but kind of um, connected to that is the enforcement tool. There, there. I believe that you know, if if anyone's paying attention to um, our criminal court system, um, our criminal court system is heavily taxed right now, particularly even after COVID. But even prior to COVID, it was. And so, for the most part, um, those types of charges, which are considered let you know nonviolent, for example are not given the, um, what's the word I'm looking for? The, uh, um, the, the, uh, the courts are reluctant to uh, basically take up court space, jail space, et cetera, for individuals that are not committing violent crimes. So code enforcement matters and, and matters such as citation of local ordinances are really not given as high priority for enforcement. So typically what would happen is if, uh, if an individual is arrested prior to the Boise case, if they would be arrested, typically they would um, they would might be taken to jail um, and then they would be booked and then they would be released. It's basically a book and release situation. And I'll you know, I'll, I'll, I'll look to our police department to give more information if you're interested in that aspect of it. But for the most part, it's not a matter of if we arrest someone for violating our camping ordinance that they go to jail and they spend days in jail. That's not the case, at least based on my experience. So I hope that answered your question. I don't know if you have any specific questions. Yeah, thank you. And I, just a, a quick follow up, uh, because there's some there's some discussion amongst people uh, uh, because we can all we see our encampments that we have along the freeway right of way and also in some of the uh, watershed protection district properties. Are those considered our city property where our ordinance is uh, applicable, or is that another property that uh, another agency uh, governs? So those go, those agencies govern their own property. It's no different from our perspective of a private property owner. It might be owned by another government agency, but we don't have the authority to um, take ownership control over those properties. So if a person is sleeping on private property, if a person is sleeping on another public agency's property, the city really doesn't have the jurisdiction to completely move them out. We have to have the cooperation and the request and the support of that property owner, regardless of whether it's a private property owner or a public property owner. And then particularly over the last year and a half with COVID, there have been CDC um, um, ish, uh, mandates that, um, that homeless encampments not be removed due to the fear over the spread of COVID. So I know that in some cases, there are other public agencies that have um, decided on a policy level not to remove encampments because of the those CDC guidance provisions. Okay, thank you. I think I, I'm one question over what I said I was gonna do, so I'll turn it back over to the mayor. <laughs> thank you, we will then go straight to Council Member Al Adam. Thank you, Mayor. You know, I, I just want to say I feel uh, very fortunate this evening as a council member, as part of this council, that we have this opportunity now to uh, revamp our crisis response system to homelessness here in Thousand Oaks. And we have a strong system. We have Lutheran Social Services. We have Harbor House. We have our city staff. We have TOPD, vulnerable population officers. But we're missing that one thing, that one thing that can really turn this situation around. That's an emergency shelter and permanent supportive housing. And we are, I feel very fortunate tonight that we are able to take a look at that and hopefully provide it. Um, 
my question is this, if I, and this was made for Shangri-La, I recall that in the staff report, it's if we are to pass this tonight, that Shangri-La could close on the Quality Inn in December, if I'm not mistaken. Now we're heading into the winter months, it's right around the corner, and if nothing's changed from last year, I'm not sure we're gonna be able to count on the churches this year to provide that temporary shelter that, like they've done in the past. So my question is, uh, if all goes well, and you're able to acquire this property by December, uh, and I know, I'm sure there'll be some tenant improvements that are involved and all, how quickly can we get it open and get people off the street? I'd like to see that happen uh, sooner than later. Okay, this is a um, question for Shangri-La, and I believe it's uh, Mr. Meyer. Yes, that, that's correct. Hi, I'm Andy Myers. I'm the CEO and owner of Shangri-La Industries. We are a vertically integrated developer builder and councilman. To answer your question, yes, currently we have the quality in under contract. We can absolutely, and we are planning on closing uh, prior to the end of the year. Because we are a vertically integrated company, we're able to execute on the construction very, very quickly. We are gonna be, in our current performer, we're contemplating bringing $11 million of our own capital and debt to the table. So as we are going through this due diligence process, um, you know, doing the need, doing all the things you need to do with the property, we're going through the architectural services too. So working with the city departments, working with your, your building and safety department, we're able to get this project to basically be permit ready by the time we close. And we'll be able to start construction Working with uh, your housing authority to determine the best course of action as far as occupancy under home key round two, there's actually bonuses to get these projects online very, very quickly. So we would be contemplating either we could have the, the property partially occupied while we do a renovation, or we can do the renovation promptly in less than, than six months and have it fully occupied, um, permanent supportive signed off by all the local agencies and federal agencies so that you have all the units for supportive housing. But yes, in the calendar year 2022, you, under our plan, you would be able to, to house the, the entire building. Okay, well, that's what I would be looking for. I, I noticed you mentioned uh, partial occupancy. That's, that's fine. Uh, that's better than none. So I, I'm just getting at, you know, I know there's some steps we have to go through here and there's some improvements you have to do, but I hope you can do that concurrently with opening those rooms up because the winter time is the time when our, our unhoused populations are at the most risk. And I, I want to see those people in those rooms. Um, Madam Mayor, if I can also make one additional comment is that the rotating winter shelter that we've had in the Conejo Valley um, they are looking at restarting um, that program this winter. The details are not available at this time, but there is a recognition that there's that need, um, you know, in the in the short term. So um, I just wanted to share that with uh, Councilmember Adams so that you know that that is an additional resource that will be potentially available. And um, I also want to state that, you know, if the item is approved by the city council this evening and, and many mansions has their emergency shelter component, that doesn't mean that the rotating winter shelter um, goes away, that there, there is, you know, a need for those, those beds. Uh, that's good to hear, Ingrid. Thanks. Thank, Thank you, you, Mayor. Thank you. And um, I do have a question also. I don't see Mr. Jones's hand up, but uh, the question is for Mr. Myers, Andy Myers with Shangri-La. Uh, you're a different kind of developer, not one that we usually see in the city of Thousand Oaks. And I was just wondering um, how Shangri-La came about. So, um, thank you, Mayor. Uh, we, we were, I, I founded uh, Shangri-La in 2008 and we were founded as a developer builder. We've done a lot of market rate developments. We've done some work for the US federal government via the GSA, um, doing single tenant assets, everything from FBI and ICE buildings in Guam to social service buildings in you know, Baton Rouge. Uh, it, it just runs the gambit. We've built some of the most prominent pro uh, projects in the city of Los Angeles and throughout um, Southern California. 
And one of the things that we I became very passionate about was dealing with homelessness. And I met Todd Lipka in 2009, and we've been really focused on figuring out how to take all the inefficiencies out of affordable housing, in particular the cost and the time. And so <clears throat> with the ability to leverage our, our significant balance sheet and to partner with a service provider like Todd, we at Shangri-La really shifted gears and focused more primarily on the um, affordable housing components. And we focused a lot with homeless veterans in the beginning, and we've really been focused on the uh, at-risk population, as Todd has said, uh, stated earlier. And really the key for us is we go for wherever the need is. And Thousand Oaks is a very unique community, being a native Southern Californian, I understand, and I, I have a lot of friends and family that live in in and or around Thousand Oaks. So we, we know that we're not coming in to tell you guys what you need. We're coming in to satisfy and work with you for a need that many people in and around the community, as was uh, stated by Councilman Adams, people who are living in areas that you do not have jurisdictional control over, you know, we need to, that are, that are basically adjacent or in Thousand Oaks, we're here to provide that permanent support of housing. And I think um, what the conclusion that I came to as an individual is that I wanted to put my personal resources towards affordable housing because I think the standard way in which we do it, the, the tax credit and bond um, way is just far too expensive and takes far too long. So we are looking at cutting out as much as 50, 60% of the cost and doing it in the fraction of, of the time. Our, our first two home key projects were the two most affordable projects in the state, not in rural areas. We did one in Salinas and one in San Bernardino. Uh, we, were, we were able to do those for approximately $200,000 a key. We're looking at projects here in the city of Los Angeles that are upwards of $700,000 a key the same exact product type going with tax credit and bond way. So really, it's been my passion to see people housed, and it's been a passion of mine uh, to make sure that we as all the taxpayers are also getting the value for our dollar as well. So I, I don't know, I hopefully I answered your question, but. You did, thank you so much. I appreciate it because it is refreshing to see a developer do something different. Uh, really appreciate that. Uh, we're going back to council member Kevin McNamee for an additional three questions. Your microphone, council member McNamee. Thank you, Madam Mayor. When I was introduced to this program last week. I was under, actually I was told that it was mostly temporary housing with some permanent housing there. And now I'm hearing that it's mostly permanent housing, if not all. Uh, my first question wasn't really answered fully. Uh, again, I'm seeing that the model is one where residents will be able to go in and out of that location. What impact is expected on the local residents with the homeless concentrated in one area? Okay. So again, I'm going to, um, you know, throw this to the experts that are on the call and that have experience developing projects and how to mitigate any impacts, if any. Um, so I am going to ask that we have Rick Schrader respond. Um, again, we do have projects locally in Thousand Oaks. He can speak to that experience. And then um, we can have Shangri-La respond. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you. Yeah, again, permanent support of housing is apartment housing. People are not coming in and out. They live there. Uh, nevertheless, uh, we want to make sure that the, that the impact on the community is minimized. So we have on-site management. We do all the property management. Units are not overcrowded. They're not dirty. We, there's no drug usage. We have drug-free housing. Um, there's no loud parties. Uh, there's very few disruptions. So these are permanent communities that are very well maintained, that are quiet, and are, I think, a very uh, positive for the uh, neighborhood. And I think I would simply cite uh, here in Thousand Oaks, Hillcrest Villas. It's the most beautiful building, apartment complex on Hillcrest. And yet that has 30 units of supportive housing. 
This is not a drop-in center for homeless people. This is a place that people live uh, every day. Um, now, if you're asking about what the, how the emergency shelter is going to work, uh, that will be a different type of thing. That will be temporary housing. There'll be securities. There'll be, there'll be on-site staff 24 seven. There will be uh, quite a bit of uh, structure as to where they can go, what they're doing, uh, the type of, they can't have visitors, they can't use drugs, they can't do this, they can't do that. So that'll be a much more regulated environment. And that's one of the reasons that we wanted to partner with Turning Point who runs such an emergency shelter um, because they, they know a lot better uh, than we do. In, in terms of permanent housing, permanent supportive housing, the quality in, that's where people live. That's going to be an apartment complex. So let me come back to the question mm -hmm. of how many people are gonna be served and how much of that is permanent housing, permanent supportive housing, how much is this emergency temporary housing? Yeah, I'll just briefly, my understanding, what, what we're looking at based on the request for qualifications is an apartment, is a uh, motel that we can convert to perhaps 70% of the beds as permanent supportive housing and 30% as emergency housing. So uh, approximately around 20 beds, 30 beds, no more than that as emergency. So we're looking at a total of 100 total units with 70 being permanent and 20, 30 being emergency, correct? I, I believe, yes. And we'll, again, 80% of the drug or the um, homeless out there are, are, are suffering with every day mm -hmm. drug, drug addiction, mental illness, and uh, they, they need those kind of treatments to help sustain themselves and get, hopefully, job training to become yeah. independent. Is that something that's going to be available for both the emergency shelter as well as the permanent uh, support? Uh, I'll speak on behalf of many mansions. Absolutely. That is really one of the the, the benefits of having a permanent year-round shelter or housing because there you have a location that you can provide those services your own case management staff you can get the county agencies involved other health providers it's hard to treat people when they're living in encampments and under bridges but when they're there uh, you can treat them you can get them the support that they need you can get them the counseling that they need uh, the drug rehab substance abuse things like that uh, but i could let todd and, and others talk about that, but that is definitely one of the advantages of having this type of permanent uh, housing and interim housing. Thank you. I wanted to ask Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones, did you have any questions? I see you don't have your hand up, but you unmuted it, yourself. Yeah, I, I have a quick question. I've heard from some of the, our people here that they're concerned about a, uh, what is the effect of building shelters in terms, are, are we attracting uh, more homeless people to come here? Like, you know, if you build it, they will come. I think the answer I got to that a, a while back was that that is not the case, that they are used uh, almost uh, exclusively to house people that are already here. Is that is that true or is there some indication that it, it would uh, inspire or motivate some people, homeless people, to come to Thousand Oaks? I, I can answer that. Again, we're the largest provider of permanent supportive housing. Overwhelmingly, our housing in Thousand Oaks is populated by people from Thousand Oaks that have lived here, grew up here, work here. Our supportive housing in Oxnard, people from Oxnard. Simi Valley, people from Simi Valley. Nobody even wants to travel from Oxnard to Simi Valley. We get very few people coming from out of county. That's our experience. Yeah, well, that's the answer I heard before. I just wanted to have somebody reiterate that yeah. to make sure that that is the case. One thing I've heard tonight that really hit home with me because I, uh, let's face it, I know, I don't, don't know, but I imagine that most of us on the council occasionally hear from people complaining about the homeless camps and so forth. Uh, I think that, that uh, they ought to have the same level of compassion that is permeating this, 
discussion tonight. And I really like to hear that being homeless is no crime because I think some people have that mental outlook uh, and it's not correct. Uh, I believe that this is a, an effort that we all ought to be in together. Um, and I really, really would uh, compliment everybody that's spoken. I'd like to compliment Ingrid on the quality of the uh, presentation that she made and all the material that she uh, worked on. I, I don't know how you do that, Ingrid. I'd hate to have that job. So I hats off to you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, thank you. Um, Mrs. Hardy, I do have a question about page 13 or slide 13. What is the exact percentage of the current homeless population in the city of Thousand Oaks where the unhoused have substance abuse problems? It says here 25, but um, just overall. So I'm... I'm Pardon me, Mayor, looking through my notes, but if you're um, on the slide where the subpopulation data is listed, that information is self-reported. Um, and... So the, the total percentage of unhoused yeah. who have substance abuse problems in the city of Thousand Oaks. Yes, we have 25%. But, and again, that data is, is self-reported, and that's from our last point-in-time count. Okay, and I wanted to ask the deputies, uh, Chief Paris or Deputy Richter, uh, what is your experience or knowledge of the percentage of unhoused who have substance abuse problems? I don't have the exact uh, number, but I could, uh, I could get that for you if you're asking for just my best guesstimate. Um, I, I would, I would say it would be somewhere between, uh, 25 to, to 50%, but I can get that number for you. Thank you. Okay. So that is within the realm of what was reported in the, um, um, on, on slide 13. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, let's see. We do have a long list of speakers. We have 25 speakers and I do see two more hands up. So we're going back to... Council Member McNamee with uh, three questions, and then Mayor Pro Tem Bob Engler with three. Madam Mayor, uh, may I ask if we could have a five minute break after uh, uh, Council and McNamee's uh, questions? Well, yeah. Council Member Jones, why don't we do that now and we'll come back so that way uh, you'll be more comfortable. Is that all right? It's fine with me. Is okay, okay we'll, with you, we'll, take, we'll take a quick break then. Thank you.
And welcome back. I see we have uh, four council members. And we were going to go to council member McNamee for three more questions and then to Mayor Pratem Engler and then we will go to public comments. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'd like to ask that the residents who are gonna be paying rent, uh, they'll lease, the prop, lease their units. Where do they get their money from? Uh, again, are they given jobs? Is it coming from state taxpayers subsidized from the state? Where do the income come from in order to provide that lease payment? Mrs. Hardy? Uh, again, uh, Mayor, I'm going to call on the people that are actually dealing with the tenant. So I see Rick is still on the line if he'd like to address the question as well as. Um, and then, yeah. yeah, and maybe we can also hear from the uh, step up CEO, Todd. Yeah. Todd Lipka. Go ahead, Mr. Schrader. Yeah. Yeah, very briefly. I mean, our residents have a variety of sources of income. Some do have jobs. Uh, some do work. Uh, they work in different industries, service industries, restaurant industries. They earn money. The thing with supportive housing is that only, and like most affordable housing, only 30% of their income goes toward the rent. Uh, that's why rents are very low. Other residents do have Social Security, uh, our elderly residents, uh, Social Security disability, uh, maybe other types of government assistance, Social Security, disability, and um, earnings. Thank you. Again, uh, I'm going to go with question two, which tells back to previous questions I've asked that hasn't been answered completely. So I'm going to ask it again. Uh, maybe you said, but I didn't hear. How many total units are we talking at this location? Uh, perhaps that's for Shangri-La. And then the second question that's not been answered yet is what is the impact to the local business with these units being there? So we have so we, Good. Sure, this is Andy again. Um, Councilman, there will be at the uh, quality and there will be 77 permanent supportive housing units. Um, as far as the impact to the local businesses and communities, we actually carry on-site property mm -hmm. management we also have on-site on supportive services. And in addition to that, we actually have on-site security 24 hours a day for at least the first 12 months in order to just make sure that, you know, not so much the tenants, but other people that come in and out, that things are controlled and that the impact to the local neighbors and community is mitigated to the extent that that's humanly possible. Um, I think, as as has been stated, we work very, very hard to make sure that everybody gets assimilated into housing and permanent supportive housing being really the key. So um, I, I don't know how else to, to answer that. I think maybe Todd Lipka from Step Up would be, um, can give you a more in-depth answer. We're, we're focused on the development side and the construction and Todd is the service provider as well as the building manager. Thank you. Uh, do we have Mr. Lipka? I see he's still with us, but he's not on camera or microphone. Todd, are you available? Not sure if he can hear us. Yes. Yes, go ahead. So I'm not sure if you heard the question, uh, Mr. Lipka? Yes, I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. I, I, I've been listening, but I'm, oh, there's a camera. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, well, Step Up has a good neighbor policy for all of our locations. Um, that we interact as a good neighbor with, with all of our neighbors in the surrounding area. And we have tremendous experience, Councilman, of citing these projects in very vibrant commercial communities. So we have projects in downtown Santa Monica, in downtown Hollywood. And in fact, we have a 36-unit motel conversion uh, near Hollywood and Vine in Hollywood. And um, literally next door is a preschool and one block away is an elementary school. So we're really seen as an asset to the neighborhood because we stabilize the property. We, we're taking a motel, uh, which has a lot of uh, comings and goings and turning it into apartment building. There's 
uh, service intensive services because we put staff right on site who are working with the tenants. So really, uh, in our experience, maybe unbelievably, uh, our neighbors see us as, as an asset and as a good neighbor. Thank you. And for my last question, uh, the third one, and uh, Madam Mayor, I'd like you to make you aware that I do have many after here. So when the public comment is done, I want to come back and have my questions answered. Uh, the um, issue that I hear from many, many residents is the jurisdiction issue with Caltrans versus city. And as our city attorney outlined is that the condition of Caltrans controlling Caltrans, and we can't really do much about it, that would be, for example, Jans Road and the 23 Freeway or the 101 near the Oaks Mall, where business owners at the Oaks Mall complain of shoplifting occurring in their stores frequently. And then the uh, homeless go back into the Caltrans protective area where uh, CHP does not remove them or address the issue. The other one is uh, uh, one of the restaurant tours in that region mentions how a homeless person comes in to use the restroom and then smears feces all over the walls. So the, this is a major impact for these businesses, having the homeless there in the area, which drives away business and can put them out of business for these people who are trying to make a living. So my question is, we have many camps that exist on Caltrans property. And the ones with the biggest fist, the loudest voice, are the ones who control the law right there in those camps. And they know to hide on Caltrans property. Yes, we're putting in 77 permanent housing at this location, which is denting only the 242 identified. So therefore it will probably be filled up very quick. How do we go about compelling those that are on Caltrans property to either participate in this particular project and or future ones who just may wanna be homeless and that's where they wanna be and continue with that lifestyle, but yet still come in and disrupt the quality of life for our good residents here in Thousand Oaks. Any thoughts? Um, Madam Mayor, I can uh, take that question. Um, we have actually been in regular conversations with Caltrans um, and particularly as it relates to their um, policy on how they address homeless encampments. And one thing that they have made very clear with um, the city, with TOPD and other stakeholders that have participated in these meetings is that they will cooperate with cities so long as there is a place to send the individuals living in those encampments for housing. And in our last discussion, I did share um, with Caltrans, it was probably a good four to six weeks ago, that we were working on an item to go to the city council for consideration of emergency shelter and permanent supportive housing. And at that time, they indicated that they would um, work in conjunction with our law enforcement and with the city um, to provide housing or, or to move the individuals from the encampments um, into to housing. They just wanna make sure that that resource is available. One thing that I will check as well is I believe that the state has appropriated dollars to help deal with encampments, but I wanna track that down first um, and before um, confirming that with you. But they are aware that it is an issue across the state. They, Caltrans has a way of um, I providing a priority level. That's what they call them, priority levels to the encampments. And so we are working closely with them to address our local encampment challenges. Ms. Hardy, let me, um, the numbers aren't adding up for me. We only have 77 at this particular facility we're talking about right now with 242 in the city itself. So those 77 are gonna be consumed and we won't have any other place to put the remaining. So Caltrans then will not come in with CHP to remove them from Caltrans property because we have no place to put them. Is that is that a fair assessment? Well, currently, you know, Shangri-La did mention that there are 77 units at the Quality Inn and Suites. And then there also will be the units that are being pursued by many mansions. So our hope is that through this, um, through the um, actions tonight, that there will be a larger inventory um, and, you know, this is just, it's doesn't, you know, 
accommodate every person experiencing homelessness in Thousand Oaks, but it certainly is a, a step to help um, helping our unhoused population. So this will not stop the issue going on with Caltrans and the Jans in 23, as well as the 101 by the Oaks Mall, because again, until we get enough permanent supportive housing, Caltrans isn't gonna be able to do anything for us with uh, CHP to address those homeless on their property. Uh, again, I just wanna make sure I'm clear on that. Can, can, I, weigh, can I weigh in, Ingrid? Do you mind if I weigh yes. in real quick? I, yes. I, yes, Jeremy, and then I'll, I'll make a comment. Thank you. Yeah, so um, right now, if we're gonna arrest somebody on Caltrans property, Caltrans has to be willing to prosecute that person. And that's because it's a trespassing on their property. And that's part of the issue here is because of the COVID restrictions and stuff, they're not willing to do that. We anticipate that once those COVID restrictions are in place. And then the other issue comes in if, as a state agency, if they're signing for trespassing, I'm sure their lawyers are advising that they're gonna be coming under the uh, purview of Boise Martin in doing that. And they're concerned about that. So I, I, I think the, the goal here is, right, we have a tool in these shelters and once we have beds available, we'll be able to enforce again, and we will get the cooperation of those state agency as well. And, and to give a little bit of kind of an indication of the, where the cooperation is going, they have assigned the CHP officer out of the Moore Park Station to be uh, a liaison officer on the homeless uh, front, which is which is a good sign for us that the state is at, at least uh, putting some efforts forward uh, here and in, in working on it. So we just don't have any tools right now, and this will give us tools to be able to address some of these issues. And once the COVID um, situation's over, and then we have dealt with the Boise Martin restrictions we have, we should be able to have some tools and move forward, even on the Caltrans properties. And the other comment that, thank you, Chief, the other comment that I would make to that is, um, you know, some of the our other communities are leaving beds available for law enforcement so that there is that tool available um, to enforce as needed and to get individuals into a shelter. Um, and then the second comment that I would make is that the uh, one of the things I mentioned earlier in the presentation is that the shelter is designed to be temporary. And so if you have individuals in a shelter and they're moving on to permanent housing solutions, be that, you know, going back with a family, reuniting with their family or entering permanent supportive housing, um, obtaining rental assistance, whatever that permanent housing solution may be, ideally there's that pathway for um, a person experiencing homelessness to go from a shelter into a, a permanent housing Thank, thank you, Ms. Hardy. Mayor Pro Tem Engler, please. Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Council Member McNamee uh, said something that uh, caught my attention, and I just want to get some clarification, if I could, from our, our police officers. Um, he mentioned that perhaps there was some criminal activity that occurred, and we had to wait for CHP to become involved. Is that is that the, the standard operation pr pr procedure for? The sheriff is to wait for, um, you know, a, a CHP if there's criminal activity, such as that unfortunate. Uh, I didn't say that. Um, I, I'm I, sorry. Did I? No, I didn't say that. What I said is that for our local city police to go on to Caltrans property to uh, address the homeless issue there. It's oh, I see. I, I, I thought you were seeing somebody. I, I thought you're saying someone had uh, stolen things out of the mall and then went on the property and we had to wait. Is that uh, no, that's, not no, that's not what I was saying. No, no. Our, our, our sheriff, I'm sorry, I, I misunderstood you then. I misunderstood you. Um, I, I, I'm assuming that our sheriffs can go on, on Caltrans property, make arrests for criminal activity, correct? Yeah, that is correct. There's things like trespassing where they the state would have to sign, um, basically we call it signing, but basically have to be willing to prosecute. Those are the things that we wait on the state for. Doesn't stop us from going and enforcing enforcing laws on that property. Okay, that, that that's reassuring. Thank you for that. And, and then, uh, hello. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm I'm, I'm sorry. Um, then a, a couple of questions for our for our um, our provider uh, our projected providers, and I appreciate what uh, Councilman McNamee is saying as far as impacts on, on the neighborhood, um, although it's mainly commercial in that area. Um, 
in your experience, and I'm glad we have two professional groups that can answer this type of thing. In your experience, have you seen um, an, uh, problems that affect the neighbors? Uh, and uh, have you been able to um, mollify any of those issues? And either, either, uh, either group can go. Todd, why don't you go first? Sorry. Uh, this is Todd. Um, you know, generally we don't see uh, issues. We really have a strong presence when these projects open up, really to provide intensive support to each individual. I, I will say these individuals go through a process, but it's it's quite a private adjustment process. You know, they've, they've acquired a tremendous amount of skills to survive on the street in a state of homelessness. And there's a big adjustment that they go through. Um, but that's mostly, you know, it's like learning to sleep in the bed. How do you clean an apartment? So that's what the staff do. What we do find is that if there are going to be issues, it's generally going to be caused by them bringing homeless friends from the street into their unit. So we have a very strong presence on site at the beginning of lease up, even before lease up, to ensure that we monitor that very quickly. Andy talked about we have a security presence. Um, we have people live on site as well as people work on site. So it's pretty intensive as a way to discourage that from happening. You know, I can't say nothing ever happens, but it's not very common, and it's usually in the the first couple months of the project. And then we really encourage our neighbors. You know, we, we reach out to them. They can call us directly. They'll have the numbers of staff on site. So if there's any issue, uh, they can call us, and, and we'll respond to it very, very quickly. But we have a, a really, uh, quite honestly, a fabulous track record in this area. Okay, and then um, Mr. Schroeder, uh, Schroeder uh, do you have... Uh other input on that as well? I do. I mean, I completely agree with Todd. I think one of the challenges, especially in, a, in support of housing, our residents are the most quiet. The challenge is, is actually getting them out of their apartment unit. They tend to be very isolated, and we work a lot with socialization with others. Uh, they tend to stay in their units, and the challenge is to get them out. We certainly did have one incident once. Um, where we had some teenagers at our property uh, sneak into a neighbor's pool, uh, but that had nothing to do with them being homeless, formerly homeless, and just being teenagers. So, but 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 problems with with uh, neighbors are very rare. Great, and and um, thank you for that, and uh, that's reassuring. And I appreciate uh, Councilman McNamee's concerns that uh, people have brought to him. So, um, and then. Uh, Ms. Hardy, I, I had a question. More just, I think, a clarification. Ha, you know, having been on the committee, um, I think uh, we're somewhat familiar, and I'm impressed by the amount of work that was done on that committee, the amount of work done by staff and the, and the uh, consortium of, of uh, county and other uh, nonprofit agencies. Um, really, just two questions, I think. Can you re go over? Um, how what we're proposing tonight uh, has been put out there since, gosh, 2018, and kind of go over those points again and how, how it sort of fits and where we have been aiming for these last few years. Sure, um, Mayor Pro Tem Engler. So when the ad hoc committee was initially formed, the goal at the time with the committee was really just to get up to speed on the landscape of homelessness in Thousand Oaks. And so that involved, you know, conversations with law enforcement, local social service providers, kind of um, building an understanding of how do you address homelessness locally. The committee has taken a measured and incremental approach, um, you know, uh, education and outreach, you know, how, how do you, you deal with panhandlers? Well, maybe, you know, the committee at the time Let's educate our residents on giving the social service providers. The city council has supported our um, local social service agencies through grant funds, and you commit it to continuing to do that. Um, you know, and when it came time to look at, you know, again, looking back at the crisis response system, 
um, and what are the gaps there? And that was one of the things when the city council signed on to the countywide MOU of committing to um, looking at emergency shelter and permanent supportive housing. And so again, it's been an incremental and, and measured approach. And um, with the statistically valid survey with the prior ad hoc committee, the discussion was, you know, okay, let's look at housing. How do we go about doing that? And, and so the questions were posed in that survey. Would, would residents support a shelter in Thousand Oaks? Would, the res would residents support um, permanent supportive housing? And that data came back as, as being um, supportive. And so um, again, measured incremental to leading to just earlier this year where the city council unanimously approved your um, priorities in March. And the number two priority um, that was adopted by the city council is to identify and advance solutions for emergency shelter and permanent supportive housing in Thousand Oaks. And then finally, with the committee's update this um, past June, um, staff did inform that the city council that in alignment with your priority that we would release an RFQ to identify a developer operator for emergency shelter and permanent supportive housing. And that has led to the uh, recommendations before you this evening. Um, we didn't go into the process expecting to find two, um, but that is our, again, our recommendation tonight to help meet um, you know, the needs locally and to address your adopted priority. Thank you. I think that's my third question, so I'll save any others for later. Thank Ms. you, Madam so, Mayor. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate that there are additional questions from council members, but we really need to go to our public speakers. We have, as of now, 25, so I don't want them to wait any longer. Um, I will begin with Denise Cortez, who is joining us via video. She's the executive director of Harbor House. Uh, we have already heard from Rick Schroeder, who, or Schrader, who was supposed to be after Den Denise. So, um, but at any rate, go ahead, Ms. Cortez. Start with, yeah, and right next. Hello, thank you, Madam Mayor. I appreciate that. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you and see you. My name is Denise Cortez and I am the founder and director of Harbor House. We work with those experiencing homelessness here in Thousand Oaks every day all over the Conejo Valley. We feed them, we offer them showers and laundry, and most importantly, we offer them case management, which is the single thing that can help them move forward in their life. One of the main things that we focus on in addition is keeping people who are housed, housed. I think it's the number one thing that any community can do to battle homelessness when people are housed and their rent is difficult or they come across crises, they're living in poverty, it's very important that we help them stay housed. In late 2020, Conejo Valley Unified School District told us that over 200 children, students of theirs, were currently experiencing homelessness. And what that meant was that they were living in cars or motel rooms or in unstable living housing situations, couch surfing, things like that. And a very important piece of homelessness is the connection that it has to foster care. Within 18 months of foster youth being emancipated, 40 to 50% of those kids become homeless. 40 to 50%. Here in Thousand Oaks, our experience in our database of the homeless, that that number is much higher. It's closer to 70% of our local homeless. Their stories began in foster care, and that's important for us to know. Nationally, 50% of the homeless population spent some time in foster care. Foster care correlates with becoming homeless at an earlier age and remaining homeless for a longer period of time. I want to personally, for all the years that I've been working in the Conejo Valley with on the homeless situation. I really want to thank our city leadership and the council members 
for all the groundwork that you've done. Ingrid, your presentation was so informative for people who don't know about the homeless situation here. I think all the groundwork that you did, all of you, to bring this proposition to us tonight is, is true leadership, and I really want to thank you. My husband and I have lived in Thousand Oaks for 34 years and raised four children. I think Thousand Oaks is a beautiful city. It's made up of really good people who do really good things. It's a great city to raise a family in. And I think it's so important that we do this, that we say yes to these proposals tonight, because we all know that it's the right thing to do. So thank you for your time and for all the work you've done. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Rick uh, Schrader with Many Mansions. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I'll make my comments very brief. I, I think, to a certain extent, the conversation among council is really focused on a certain type of homelessness, a certain population that's homeless, which is something that does, is present and, and something we do must we must address. But I think the comments from Denise just now really bring it back that homelessness has many different faces. There are homeless children. We Many Mansions actually has two properties specifically for chronically homeless families, children who've been homeless for more than been more than homeless for more than one year. We have two properties for homeless veterans. Veterans that fought for our country have been homeless. Uh, we have a property specifically for homeless transition-aged youth, youth between ages 18 and 24. Can you imagine being 18 and homeless? One of our new projects uh, in collaboration with the Area Housing Authority and County Land will be a, prop, a property a supportive housing for homeless elderly, an elderly, elderly population age 62 and above who are also homeless. So homelessness is not confined to a certain type of person. Uh, it, it encompasses everyone. So that's why I, I, we strongly recommend the, 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 the recommendation. We're very excited and honored to be recommended uh, to lead a team with the Area Housing Authority and Turning Point and trying to find a location for more permanent supportive housing, but also that necessary emergency interim housing that we have spoken about this, uh, this night. So thank you very much, and we're very honored uh, by the recommendation. Thank you. Next, we have Jennifer Amodi, followed by Rosanna Guerra. Okay, we don't have Jennifer. Let's go to Rosanna Guerra via video. My name is Rosanna Guerra, and I've been a resident of the city of Thousand Oaks since 1993. I'm speaking before you today to lend my support for the proposal of permanent supportive housing in our city. I don't know how many of you have had the opportunity to speak with veterans, single mothers, older adults who have by the unfortunate circumstance found themselves without a home. I have for 10 years. To speak to another individual who is looking for immediate solutions because of the desperate circumstances that they find themselves was the saddest part of my job. To have to tell homeless families, older adults, that there are no alternatives and have to and, and hear them break down and cry made my search for answers, made me search for answers. Where can someone stay overnight where they wouldn't be noticed? Where can someone sleep and be safe and not call attention to themselves? How I, is how I managed to help because no other solutions existed. Trying to inspire hope in a hopeless situation is quite a task. There is something inherently dehumanizing about being homeless. I'm hopeful that with the approval of this proposal, the city is truly seeing those that are the most vulnerable among us and offering them a safe, loving, and hopeful future. Thank you. Next, we have Beverly Wirtz, followed by Allison Gray. Madam Mayor, City Council members, regarding the permanent or temporary housing for the homeless in our community, this only enables their dysfunctional behavior, repeated um, vicious cycle that does not deal with the root cause of homelessness. Just getting them off the street does not solve the problem. 
the homeless have serious many uh, mental issues, drug and alcohol abuse that needs to be addressed while providing shelter that gives them a safe environment away from our kids' school, away from our parks, shopping malls, and allowing them to panhandle at our local grocery stores. They need rehabilitation and learn work skills so that one day they can be productive members and contributing to society. The Lindell Rehabilitation Centers is an excellent example, and they're more than willing to come into any city and community and help set these up. Shangri-La is one of the uh, providing the housing, seems to be some sort of shell company because nothing is really revealed of their vested self-interest and where the funds actually come from. The professional speaking tonight did not adequately address the concerns of rehabilitation and the mental health issues of these many of these people. You all sugarcoat this uh, deeply, you sugarcoat this deep, complex issue. These speakers talk of the homeless as being temporary, uh, down and out, but does not address the vagrants, the homeless that I see around town, up the street within walking distance uh, of the local strip mall, panhandling in front of CVS and the local grocery store. Uh, the homeless, uh, I've even seen them fall off the uh, sidewalk into oncoming traffic. And um, it's a lie saying that these homeless are longtime uh, Thousand Oaks residents. These are deranged, mentally ill adults uh, on drugs and alcohol. I see them in front of my grocery store, CVS. Um, these are not longtime Thousand Oaks residents going through my trash can every uh, Sunday night when the trash cans are put out. With all the government handouts, the Section 8 stimulus checks, welfare, money, food stamps, et cetera, there should be no homeless. If I gave away permanent housing, I would have 90% retention rate too. That proves nothing. Allison Gray, followed by Elizabeth McDonald. Do we have Allison Gray? Yes, hi, yes. Uh, yes, my name is Allison Gray. I live in Newbury Park. Uh, my family and I have lived in the area since 1976, and we love the Canal Valley, and we are happy and blessed to call it home. Um, I will say and uh, reflect uh, Council, members, uh, Council Member McNamee's comments. Uh, this is a new project that I was unaware of until just a few days ago, and the presentation that was delivered was very informative and has answered some of my concerns and some of my questions. I will say that uh, Council, members, uh, Council Member McNamee's questions concerning uh, the congregation and concentration of the homeless population at a single location uh, does concern me. Uh, some of those concerns have been addressed and assuaged uh, as a result of some of those questions and some of those answers. Um, I will um, express concern over incentivizing homelessness, if that, if that makes sense. If you do provide uh, low-cost housing in a permanent fashion to people, um, my concern is that you incentivize a certain lifestyle and a certain choice. Um, I heard Council, uh, Council Member McNamee mention that many homeless people actually make that choice and given the choice of being housed and being on the streets, many, uh, unbelievably to, to many of us, do make the choice to remain on the streets. Uh, rules and rehab and employment and counseling often does not appeal to uh, these individuals. So I'm not sure about the extent uh, that this problem can be addressed by permanent su uh, supportive housing. I would be curious to know the success rate where the, uh, the permanent supportive housing has been implemented in other cities. I have heard that is, it has a, a great success, but I'm wondering what the numbers are, if there's a before and an after, some kind of a statistical proof of that success. If we have about 242 individuals unhoused now in the city, what might we have as a success rate of seeing a visible improvement in our city a reduction of encampments, a reduction of people loitering on our street corners, the CVS that was mentioned earlier on Moore Park, and I think it's uh, Thousand Oaks Boulevard. There are some locations in particular where uh, the homeless are visible and they wander into traffic. That happened to me a few months back. 
where a homeless person uh, lurched into traffic. Several drivers had to swerve to avoid this person. He was flailing. He was talking to someone who wasn't there. Certainly a sad a state of affairs. So I'm hoping that this kind of project can alleviate those visible problems and um, help truly help the people that it intends to help. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker is Elizabeth McDonnell, followed by Nico Van Niekerk. Elizabeth McDonnell, I live in Oak Park. And I just want to address um, your shelter for the homeless. I think it's, um, it is a very good idea, but it just can't stand on its own. These people have mental is issues. They've been abused. They have um, schizophrenia, PTSD. I mean, there has to be in place psychological counseling, medical care, teaching them job skills that will make them independent and be productive in our society, in our community, not just free government handouts. And I think I don't think Thousand Oaks has the infrastructure to um, maintain these demands in our community. OK, I mean, what are you going to do if someone is in a housing facility and it's near a school and it goes off on a schizophrenic um, tantrum and hurts a child. What are you going to do that then? Also, um, my question is, who is the Shangri-La company? Is it a Chinese company? Is it going to integrate the smart cities when they build these apartments? And will they also implement the social credit score system? So who really is Shangri-La? Thank you. The next speaker is Nico Van Niekerk, followed by Clint Foltz. Do we have Nico? Nope. Hello. Are you there? Hello. Yes, sir. Good evening. Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yes. OK. Um, let me just please click here. I'm Nico Van Niekerk, a 30-year resident of Thousand Oaks. I want to offer my opinion about the homeless issue, which is a serious issue, and it is encouraging that the city is addressing this issue head, head on. I was quite surprised by uh, the, uh, the, the presentations tonight. If I understand the work of the ad hoc committee correctly, of course, it is to be expected that homeless accommodation within the city will create friction with neighbors of the homeless shelters for a variety of, zip of reasons. It's not always a lack of compassion, but property prices are influenced by the immediate neighborhood. There's nothing we can do about that. And that includes the increase of the incidences of petty crime, panhandlers, and so on. Homelessness is increasing and it will continue to do so. The overall objective must be to reduce the homeless population. And to do that, it would, would require intensive rehab and therapy, which would lead, to, which must lead to permanent employment. Housing can only be just the beginning of resolving the problem. Otherwise, it will increase and spin out of control. I'm the president and CEO of a consulting firm that specializes in the resolution of complex business problems, and I've been doing this for 40 years. The homeless problem is nothing other than a complex business problem. And I believe there is a resolution to this very complex problem that will not affect property prices, not create a climate of crime, and no waiting lists. The homeless tent cities alongside and encampments visible alongside the freeway and other public spaces further reflects poorly on the city. If the council is willing to look at such a solution, we can set up a meeting and I'll spend time to explain that. It won't do it any justice trying to cram this in, uh, into a three minute speech. I must say, I was very surprised to hear all the work that the council has already done about this issue. And kudos to all the people that spoke tonight and that uh, contributed so much in addressing this issue. But um, it, it should really allow the people who own property to not be infected by the neighborhood that is uh, affected by homeless people without being disparaging, uh, talking disparaging about them. Um, so 
what I also would like to suggest is that the city might be um, more um, open about what it's doing about this public problem by being, uh, I didn't know anything about this until I sat here and listened to everybody speaking. And I think there should be a greater outreach to, to, the, to the people of Thousand Oaks uh, and even in the whole entire Ventura County of what it is that the city has been doing until now, uh, which is very valuable information. Um, and um, just be more open and um, uh, informative about what, what the city is doing. Thank you. Um, so thank you very much for all you do you're doing. Thank you. Next, we have Clint Foltz, followed by Jason Meek. Hello, my name is Clint Foltz. I was born and raised in Thousand Oaks, and I'm a member of the Caneo Climate Coalition. I applaud the city for taking steps to provide permanent supportive housing and interim housing for the unhoused. We absolutely should be providing care for those in need. Any one of us here tonight could end up in a situation where we find ourselves without a home. Climate fueled disasters were the number one driver of internal displacement over the last decade, forcing an estimated 20 million people a year from their homes. Every two seconds, a weather-related disaster forces someone on the planet from their home. Let's not forget 2018's campfire that ravaged Paradise, California and destroyed over 18,000 homes and displaced over 50,000 residents. In May 2019, NPR reported that more than 1,000 families who were dis displaced by the campfire were still looking for housing six months later. Any one of us here could end up homeless due to a climate change related wildfire. I urge you to watch National Geographic's documentary titled Rebuilding Paradise to get a feel of how truly devastating things can get. To quote author Naomi Klein, because underneath all of this is the real truth we have been avoiding, Climate change isn't an issue to add to the list of things to worry about next to health care and taxes. It is a civilizational wake-up call, a powerful message spoken in the language of fires, floods, droughts, and extinctions, telling us that we need an entirely new way of sharing this planet, telling us that we need to evolve. Let's evolve. Let's share with one another, take care of one another, and build for a resilient future. Build and retrofit supportive housing and interim housing to be all electric with emergency provisions such as power and battery backup, solar power and battery backup. Build this housing like you yourself might live there, because unfortunately, there's a real possibility you might need help in the coming years. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Jason Meek with Turning Point Foundation, followed by Sister Lisa McGaffin, and then going back to Andy Myers. Thank you, Mayor, Council Members. My name is Jason Meek. I'm the Executive Director for Turning Point Foundation. And I just wanted to provide a little context to what actually a shelter is meant to do. And I also want to recognize that the community has very real concerns and they definitely deserve answers. But a shelter is much more than uh, temporary housing to where individuals get fed and they get showers and, and, and perhaps clothing. It actually is, a, is the, one of the first safety nets to where we can assess clinically and otherwise the, and, and attempt to unpack an entire lifetime often of what led to homelessness, whether it be substance abuse, trauma, some of our local, our veterans that have experienced the traumas of war or their time in service. So we have a very robust clinical department to address these issues. These are licensed clinicians. And what we do is we do provide a, a, a sort of a triage and then an assessment. And the community is absolutely right. It, it is our job as providers to be not just, not just responsive to their concerns, but to actually be proactive in educating on both what we do, what we offer, who we serve and who they can contact in the event that there is an individual in the middle of the freeway that is a potential harm to themselves or others. And to hopefully mitigate some of the overwhelmingness of this entire population on our local police department and our sheriffs. So it is much more involved than simply providing food and clothing and a place to sleep. 
And it also, it frames individuals to get prepared for permanent supportive housing, which many mansions has a, an, an amazing proven track record on doing that. A shelter, absolutely, for those that aren't perhaps not quite ready or there's not inventory for them, offers that space for them to deal with some of the hardships, some of the traumas that they've experienced and frame them for a place of their own. And then in the event that they do fall out, there are wonderful success rates, anywhere between 93 and 95, 97%, I think I heard earlier, there still is a small percentage that, that aren't quite uh, ready for that type of living environment. And where do they go? We certainly don't want them back on the streets and the shelter will certainly provide that step down and in a way that they can get the support and care that they need. Um, so these are very real concerns. Uh, what we have done in the past is we've been a community partner first. And what we do is we meet with local businesses and neighboring communities. And we do offer education on what we do, who we do it for, and how we can help, how we can be proactive. So thank you for your time. Thank you for this consideration. These are Thousand Oaks community members. All, this, all the data indicates that the vast majority are. I, I've, I've, I've done this in many populations, and it usually is a local issue, and um, we will provide local solutions. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Sister Lisa McGaffin, then Andy Myers, and then Louise Coronado. Good evening, uh, Mayor Bill de la Pena and council members. I'm Sister Lisa McGaffin, and I've been privileged to be a board member for many mansions since 1995. And I'm here tonight to support agenda item 13. Tuesday, September 9, 26 a.m. I was driving west on Jans Road and near the on-ramp to the northbound 23, I saw something moving in the bushes. It was a person covered with a large tarp as if trying to get warm and comfortable while lying on the ground. I will call him Jan's man. This past spring, you voted unanimously on the city wide goals for 2021 through 2023. Your first goal your commitment to create our equitable community plus of variables. Your awareness of our social need to develop a more equitable, accessible, safe, and welcoming and inclusive community is significant, commendable, and absolutely ripe for action. But lest awareness be the end, I'd like to review these phrases so they are not just words on paper. Equitable and inclusive community, regardless of socioeconomic status. I'm here then tonight representing Jan's man and the hundreds of homeless individuals who live on our streets, in their cars, on our hillsides, and around our blighted and increasingly empty retail centers. I'm here to make sure that their voices are heard. Please demonstrate consistent political will by approving the staff recommendations uh, in this agenda item. The consistent political will to lead our community in the quest for inclusion regarding regardless of socioeconomic status. The consistent political will to translate words about equity into new, bold, courageous initiatives, promoting the accessible, safe, and welcoming community, which is the ultimate goal of all of your city goals. And the consistent political will to collaboratively develop more permanent supportive housing, as well as emergency housing. We strongly endorse the staff recommendation to authorize an agreement with many mansions and our partners to make this dream a reality. 
I also encourage everyone involved to move forward as expeditiously. Thank you, Sister uh, McGaffin. We did not hear everything you said. The connection was actually uh, breaking up um, a few times, but thank you very much thank for your presentation. You. And especially, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Andy Myers again with Shangri-La. Mr. Myers, you heard somebody was asking if you're a Chinese company. Go ahead. Uh, th thank you, Madam Mayor. We are a Los Angeles-based construction company and real estate development company. What we are proposing to do in conjunction, in partnership with the uh, City of Thousand Oaks and Ventura County is to bring $11 million of private capital in a public-private partnership, leveraging the very best of the public sector, the private sector, the not-for-profit sector, to bring the most cost-effective project to bear more quickly than anybody else, and then to provide the services and the much-needed opportunity to these people who cannot necessarily help themselves to regain the, the opportunity to heal and to get jobs, to get the services they need, and to get assimilated back into society, get, get back in touch with their families. Our intent is to renovate the building, um, uh, the, the quality in. We are going to be putting significant dollars in to make it not only compliant with all of your building codes, but also with the federal codes um, set down by HUD. We'll be, we will be serving population, making sure that we can serve your uh, disabled population, just as you would any standard affordable housing project. This building will be converted to look like an apartment building, well landscaped, while taking into account all of the uh, architectural uh, necessities of a, of a community like Thousand Oaks. We have great attention to detail as it comes to community outreach, reaching out to the neighbors, to all the surrounding businesses and property owners to ensure that property values are maintained or improved. And the reality of the situation is that the people that will live in this building are no longer going to be homeless. We are taking people who are currently homeless off the street, we are housing them in a permanent fashion and giving them the much needed support to, to regain dignity as, as men and women. Um, we have partnered with Step Up to bring over 500 units to bear for currently homeless U.S. veterans with, with uh, permanent supportive services. We are working from Home Key Round One with Step Up to do a project in San Bernardino, which we have now taken homeless seniors off the street. We are even partnering with Monterey County to focus on, on youth, homeless youth. So the population, as was stated earlier, is, is when it comes to homelessness, is everyone. It's everything that you can think of. And so with this project, we, we request that you approve our partnership with Step Up and of course also with, with many mansions and give us an opportunity to really showcase to the rest of the country what can be done when the public sector, the private sector, the not-for-profit sector come together um, for a common mission and goal, which is to make our communities better. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Luis Coronado, followed by Jim Friedel. Okay, so I'm told Luis is not here. Then we go to our general manager of the Park District, Jim Friedel. Well, thank you, Mayor and members of the council. My name is Jim Friedel. And as general manager of the Canal Rec and Park District, I have the responsibility and privilege of working with professional Rec and Park staff who manage and maintain over 50 park and rec facilities, including eight community centers. I do want to be clear as I begin my remarks that the CRPD board has not considered this matter and I am not speaking on behalf of the board. I'm sharing my views based on my personal and professional experience working with CRPD field staff who interact with unhoused folks every single day. Like cities all across the country, Thousand Oaks has a seemingly intractable problem with homelessness. For hundreds of different reasons, too many people in our cities don't have a roof over their heads. And since public parks and open spaces are open to everyone, many of the unhoused folks spend their day with us. And that's great. CRPD staff are professional and treat all people with respect, regardless of their housing status. In fact, I suspect a majority of the homeless population who visit our parks do follow the rules and have a positive or at least a benign interaction with our staff. But 
even though we welcome everyone during the day, no one, housed or unhoused, should be staying in our parks and open spaces at night. Not in the bushes in the parks, not on the porch at the Crowley House, not in the doorwells of the community centers, not locked inside the public restrooms, not in drainage culverts, and not in our natural open spaces. And it is true that a minority of the unhoused folks are unwilling or unable to follow some of our basic park rules day or night and do cause operational problems for staff and frustration with other park patrons or neighbors. But when we do have somebody like that and we can't handle the situation, we've always been able to call the Thousand Oaks Police Department who are amazingly responsive and helpful, especially Juan and Josh. But even they can only do so much. And I think what we need and what I'm grateful the council has been working toward is that CRPD staff would love to be able to refer folks in need to an emergency shelter year round with supportive services that could help them. And we'd look forward to working with the city, county, and social service nonprofits to continue to help our unhoused population. So in closing, I just want to applaud the city staff, the city council, the city's ad hoc committee on homelessness for working so hard on strategies and solutions to address homelessness here in Thousand Oaks. Our city has been so fortunate to have had decades of good works and public services from many mansions in particular and I'm grateful that many mansions is willing to rise to this latest challenge. I support your city staff recommendation to work with private and nonprofit housing supportive services professionals to expand our community's emergency shelter and supportive housing capacity and capabilities. I believe this effort, well implemented, will tangibly improve the quality of life for both the housed and unhoused in our city. Thanks for listening and for your leadership. Thank you. Next, we have Tara Carruth with uh, the County of Ventura, and then followed by, again, Todd Lipka. Madam Mayor, I believe that Tara was just signed up to respond to questions. Okay. I think she was not added as a public okay. speaker by accident. There you are. Okay, no problem. Thank you. Good evening. We will then go to Todd Lipka again. And I would say the same. I was just signed up to okay. uh, respond to questions. Very good. Next is Alex Russell. Do we have Alex Russell? Alex Russell, do we have him or her? Oh, here we go. Okay. Same. Um, I was just I was just signed up to answer any questions. I'm the executive vice president of Many Mansions. Okay, great. Uh, next, we have. I'm not sure if Michael Nye is with us this evening. He's not. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, then we move on to Kyle Rohrbach, and after Kyle, Rena Sepulveda. Do we have Kyle? Yes, we have Kyle. There we go. Can you hear me? We see you and we hear you. Excellent. Uh, hi, I'm Kyle Rohrbach. I'm a citizen and resident of Thousand Oaks. Uh, I grew up here, lived here my whole life. Um, thank you so much for the honor and privilege of speaking tonight, um, Madam Mayor, and Council, and staff. Uh, first and foremost, I just want to join the congratulations on getting this recommendation this far. Um, it is innovative and provides an historic opportunity to have direct impact now to a, a community that is in need. And uh, clearly, I would like to lend my support. Um, I would also like to address a couple of things that, that I heard tonight. Um, you know, some of which were from public comments. I heard a lot of, you know, shelter and permanent housing can't be by itself. Um, at least the way I understand it and the way I think it's been explained by the, the experts and city staff is that it is certainly not a standalone permanent housing unit that um, I would really encourage the public to look into what wraparound services are and that uh, the staff and the resources it sounds like the community partners will be providing are uh, going to ensure that this is not just, uh, you know, just a shelter. Um, you know, I heard someone suggest that this is a complex business proposal or, or a complex business problem and 
I would just like to make sure that if any of the five voting city council members look at this as a complex business problem, uh, that you ask yourself why you're in civic service for the people. Um, but the thing that, that I'd like to address the most is uh, that that we had our own council members ask things like, what about the people who want to be homeless? And, and I just, I got like, that's infuriating because people don't choose to become homeless. And to suggest otherwise grossly uh, misrepresents and miscategorizes the majority of our unhoused population. Um, dangerously, I would suggest. Um, so, I mean, not only does it show, I think, a lack of compassion for those people, but, you know, you're, you're really is, is miscategorizing so many of the residents that live within our town that are unhappy. Um, you know, I, this is about respect and it's about responsibility. Um, you know, when you ask questions like what, what's going to happen when we, we take the, the hundreds of homeless and they put them in one place and they all congregate together. You can't ask questions that make it sound like a lab experiment. These are people, these are individuals, and they are those individuals that you all campaign to represent. And so uh, I'd like to just wrap up by, by uh, asking for all of you to vote strongly in favor of the city staff's recommendations tonight because you made a goal to be inclusive of everyone, and this is directly related to that goal. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Rina Sepulveda, followed by David she David Schechter. Do we Hello. have? Hi. Yeah. Good evening. I'm just also here to answer questions. I'm with the Turning Point Mini Mansions and Area Housing Authority team, but I just wanted to ditto everything that um, the gentleman just said, um, and I really, really appreciate the City of Thousand Oaks staff and the city council members in making this a priority. Thank you. Next, we have David Schechter. We don't see David. All right, no David. Then we will go to Aaron Chriswall. He is with Step Up. Yes, hi, thank you. Um, I'm the <clears throat> Chief Housing Development Officer for Step Up, and um, I'm also here just to answer questions about our project. Is it Chris Wall or Chris Well? Chris Well. Okay. All right, thank you. Then Tracy McAuley. McAuley? Mayor, Tracy is also on the line to answer questions as well. Okay. Then we go to David Goodman. Do we have David Goodman? Okay, we'll need a second for David. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, hi David. Hi, thank you so much. First of all, I want to preface my comments. Uh, I have listened very carefully to the staff presentation and the presentations, uh, all of the speakers. Um, the presentation was impressive and there is no doubt that a lot of hard work went into it. I want to let the council and, and uh, staff and, and Madam Mayor, I want you to know that my perspective uh, on this is that as a retired uh, police officer. I've served in Ventura County at three different law enforcement agencies here. And uh, my experience has been, unless my dog gets two bits in, my experience has been that the homeless issue is made up of, of three, three components. Those that are situationally displaced due to unforeseen circumstance, which generally is a temporary situation. Those that are homeless due to mental illness, and that would include uh, drug and alcohol addict addictions. And uh, then those that segment of the population, and contrary to what we've heard from some other speakers, my experience as a, as a field level, street level uh, police officer, is that there's a significant element of the population, homeless population that is homeless by choice because they do not want to conform to the rules of society. So they live in, in basically a parallel society doing doing what they please. And that's the segment of the population that is particularly 
um, difficult to, to deal with and cause problems. So when, as I've listened, uh, I was really mortified by Mr. Powers when he touted as a, as a level of success the fact that two years uh, into this project, 96% of the people are still in, in homeless, shelter, homeless shelter housing. The fact of the matter is, subsequent to my retirement, and this I'm going to bear my soul a little bit here, uh, I found myself in category one where I was situationally displaced due to unforeseen circumstance. In my case, it was a uh, physical injury that precluded me from earning a living sufficiently to live in traditional housing. I lived in a motorhome for two years, and I was very grateful to be able to do that. But I want to tell you, as, I, as 25 years later, as I speak to you tonight, I, I am grateful before God that I did not have a government program put me in a comfort zone to where I didn't have to dig myself out of my situation. And I think that the problem, as I've listened carefully uh, to this to these proposals, the problem is that you guys have combined the emergency shelter and the permanent supportive housing into one situation. That needs to be bifurcated and we need to move forward with it with an emergency shelter resources. And rather than spending time and energy and money in permanent, permanent supportive housing issues, you need to address the core root of the housing program, uh, of, the un, of, the, of the homeless, particularly with the segment of mental, mentally ill and, and those who refuse to conform. You need to focus on that. In, instead of treating the symptoms, you're, the problem's never going to go away. In, in California, we, we have half, 50% of the nation's homeless live in California. It's because we're generous with our resources and we, we provide wealth for the, those people and they come from all over the country. Not, not just here in Ventura County, they come from all over the country. Thank you, Do Mr. Goodman. Thank you, Mr. Goodman, your time is up. Next speaker, we have Linda Parks and then our last speaker, Supervisor Linda Parks, and the last speaker is Sue Andaloro. Hello, Council. I want to thank you, uh, particularly the committee that's making this recommendation, and also the City Council for your support, your staff for their leadership in bringing this forward, the committee that also uh, advised you. I know I've worked with many mansions, and they are good neighbors. They are very good neighbors. And the council is able to work with many mansions on the Shadow Hills project, the Villa Garcia, the SF Village, Stoll House, and your most recent one with the Hillcrest Villas uh, that you are able to do with our behavioral health department too. These are all just top-notch, high-quality housing for uh, people who are not only low income, but some with some vulnerabilities, including mental health challenges. We know at the county, uh, that you can't help people as well who are on the street with mental health issues or alcohol issues if you can't put a roof over their heads. And so that has to be the first step, is giving them that roof over their heads so you can assist them and get them mainstreamed back into society. I am so proud of the city for being able to come this far, to have going for both <laughs> transitional as well as emergency homeless shelter. I think that's just fabulous. Uh, I really want to thank you for your collaboration. This is a moment in history. While we had the redevelopment agency helping us in the past with funding for these kind of projects, we don't now. And the fact that the state with its project uh, room key is out there for us, that there are funds available. I was pleased at the Board of Supervisors to put aside funding specifically to help the cities to do these kind of projects. I do hope you'll take us up on it, and I wish you the best. I also want to give a shout out to Shangri-La that you are doing this. You could be doing, you know, major five-story high-cost um, units. Instead, you are finding yourself a model where you can do this in an affordable fashion, and you can do it in a way that um, your company can can not only make some profit, but also, importantly, providing homes for people from veterans who are homeless and, and families and others who need homes. So 
Good for you for this model. Turning Point Foundation has been our nonprofit provider for our Growing Works project, and they do great work with veterans and others with mental health challenges. You have some great opportunities here, Council. I hope you will take the state, the county, and uh, your, rec your staff recommendations and your ad hoc committee's recommendation and approve. Thank you. Thank you. And our last speaker is Sue Andaloro. Do we have Sue? We do. Sue Andaloro? Oh, can you please unmute? Sue, can you please unmute? Well, is she, I don't see her. Is she by phone? Okay, she's on mute, okay. Well, is she, we don't know if she's speaking since she's by phone. We can't see her video, okay. All right, um, if we can't hear her, then uh, we'll just move on to the, um, to staff to address any issues or concerns that were raised. Madam Mayor, Madam Mayor, may I interrupt? I did not finish the five questions I have remaining. May I do so now before staff answers them because they, they may want to address those as well. Okay, uh, Council Member McNamee, would you please uh, um, let me enter into the record a letter that I received that is also in the supplemental packet from a formerly homeless person introducing him, himself as uh, Jonathan. I grew up in Thousand Oaks. I've lived here for all of my adult life. I'm emailing you to urge you to vote uh, with for tonight's um, presentation um, um, item for a homeless shelter in Thousand Oaks. I myself struggled with homelessness soon after my dad became ill and unable to provide for our family in his or my senior year of high school. He was not able to get help from many mansions because he was on a wait list for two years living paycheck to paycheck, but he did make ends meet. So this was something that I received today in my inbox from someone from Thousand Oaks who was um, homeless. Um, Mr. McNamee, I would like to for staff to address the speaker's concerns first, and then I will go to council for further questions. Very good. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I did jot down a few things to address the comments um, from the speakers this evening. Um, first of all, um, there were several comments related to what the city has done to inform the public of the um, um, efforts that the council has taken to address homelessness. And, um, you know, just again, the city council formed an ad hoc committee in 2018. Um, you spent quite a bit of time on uh, an effort around education and outreach. There was a um, well-attended homeless symposium. You've had ongoing dialogue in your council meetings, especially around setting your city council priorities and in adopting the budget for this past year. There have been annual updates from the ad hoc committee to the full city council on the progress of the um, initial um, identified actions by the committee. Um, and then also, um, you know, just for any uh, members of the public that are looking for more information on the city's website, toaks.org backslash homelessness, um, you can find a wealth of resources um, available on the city's website, as well as a YouTube video that um, highlights uh, some of the individuals experiencing homelessness in Thousand Oaks, as well as our social service providers and what they are doing to address homelessness. Um, with regards to the services that are needed, um, you know, that members of the public mentioned this evening, um, you know, rehab, uh, mental health counseling, job training services, these are all services that are offered with permanent supportive housing. 
Permanent supportive housing is affordable housing with these wraparound services available. They are also available through, um, as was mentioned this evening by one of the speakers from Turning Point Foundation, through a shel through uh, shelters. Shelters are more than just a roof over the head and the old soup kitchen model that um, many of us may be familiar with. It's about um, you know doing that triage and identifying the services necessary and connecting individuals with a case manager um, to help stabilize um, the individual. Um, Nothing is going to solve homelessness 100%. Uh, I, I think we all know that, but I, I just want to say that. And the committee's intent um, and the work that has been done over the years has just, it has been about, you know, identifying and evaluating tools to assist in managing homelessness locally. One of the biggest impediments, um, especially after uh, the Boise ruling that we have been challenged with, is not having an emergency shelter, not having anywhere for individuals to go who are experiencing homelessness. And we encountered the same uh, challenge in working with Caltrans. They have a policy. If you want us to clear your encampment, then you need to have housing resources available, and we will certainly work with the city in doing that. Um, I mentioned the website and, um, oh, and just lastly with Project Home Key, there is information available on the state's website. That program is de designed for permanent housing and it also supports the temporary housing. But in doing so, it's recognizing that um, the pathway um, is for from interim housing to permanent housing. And so that is the reason why the RFQ was crafted in the way that it was crafted. This is the reason why um, back in June, when um, the ad hoc committee provided a homeless update um, to the city council that we um, city staff, you know, issued the RFQ in alignment with your, your priority so that we could address the interim and permanent supportive housing needs. Um, from a law enforcement perspective, I am going to ask Jeremy to chime in because he is the expert in that regard. Thank you. Chief Paris. Yeah, um, I just wanted to address this. We, some of the things we've talked about um, have been impacts of businesses. We're having those impacts now, um, and and we we need this additional tool. Uh, we really don't have any tools right now to deal with um, the illegal camping, um, and this will be an important tool for us to be able to use to move forward to uh, to do enforcement. The enforcement that uh, that really that that needs to be done to address um, address the issue. It's not gonna be a perfect tool. It's not gonna be something um, that's gonna solve our uh, all our problems, but it's a tool we don't have right now that we, we greatly need. Thank you. Was there any other staff member who wanted to address concerns by the, by the speakers? No, okay. So Mr. Jones, Council Member Jones had his hand up for, uh, from before we went to public comments. I will go to Council Member Jones and then to Council Member McNamee. Yeah, I was interested in what Mr. Goodman was saying. I don't know if he's still here, but he really brought the problem home to me to think that someone who had done all this public service uh, in, in police work for different agencies still found himself in this uh, dilemma of housing. And he laid out the problem rather well, I thought, and talked about how even with his background, you still uh, could be in danger. And, but I, he, he uh, ended and I'm trying to get my thoughts around what are what would be considered success? Uh, is success getting someone in a shelter? Is success getting somebody to clean up and get over a drug problem or something? Or is success getting someone to gradually get to the place where he can go out on his own and be self-sufficient? I mean, are the first step, first two steps I mentioned, are those considered interim 
steps are, for some people, is that the final solution? Uh, you know, that forever they're going to be dependent. Perhaps that's I mean, question. I realize that there are probably as many types of homeless as there are people, but do, 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 we, do we have a specific goal or goals that we're shooting for? I guess Mr. Goodman isn't still around, or he might have. No, he's not, but maybe Mr. Jason Meek of Turning Point, Turning Point Foundation could, could answer that question. Yes, and that's, that's a very good question. And success is quantified differently based on one's experience, backgrounds, barriers. Uh, for, for one, it may be uh, mitigating some of the, the reasons why they started drinking excessively or using drugs in the first place, dealing with that trauma. Maybe the first step is getting into a shelter to where um, they're out of the elements and they're not afraid anymore. Many of the individuals on the on the streets are not the perpetrators of violence. It, it, statistically, they're the ones that actually receive it amongst themselves. And so getting into a safe and stable environment might be the first step. It's always progressive. We always want to uh, effectively assess a problem on on similar to a medical triage. You, you understand you you assess the absolute necessities first, and then you could start uh, reverse engineering everything, so to speak, that some of those maladaptive behaviors. But it's essentially getting one to their individual highest level of capabilities. And some, it may be a traumatic event. It may just simply be, you know, I lost my job because I worked in a, a in a, the food service industry and COVID shut my place down. And there, it's a temporary situation. And then others, it may be unchecked mental illness that has led to substance abuse, that has led to maybe some legal issues, and, and there's a lot to unpack there. So uh, it is individual, uh, but the, the goal automatically is to first be safe and stable and then really truly partner with them on mitigating some of those symptoms and then going forward on a plan with them that they co-author, of course, uh, to have a meaningful and, and successful life. So it really is getting to that highest level of their individual potential. And as the gentleman said earlier, I've been in this field of behavioral health and, and homelessness my entire career, and I've yet to really hear anyone say that they willfully enjoy the position they're in and want to stay there and that that was a part of the, the master plan. Um, so, but, what, but what has happened in the modern period to cause the emergence of the homeless problem? I was in government many years ago for a good period of time, and I don't remember in those days, I'm talking about the 70s and the 80s, hearing about a homeless problem. It, it, has, has something happened in the last 10, 15 years? Was it the economy? Uh, I mean, did something change that all of a sudden brought this problem? Well, there are certainly a lot of factors that certainly uh, bolster this issue. You know, you know, pandemic aside, that, that, that you know, Mental illness and one in one in four adults in the U.S. Uh, is subject to mental illness, and that comes in different forms. Not everyone's schizophrenia. Some have crippling anxiety. So, uh, social political climate can can do that. It it could be that economic jo jobs are not tracking well with the cost of living. That's a very common one in California, particularly. There's there's a lot of things to do. People are getting educated and not finding. Um, employment that can meet the, the need, the demands of uh, having a house and then, uh, you know, exorbit student loans. Uh, we've been in a war uh, on and off for, you know, a couple of decades. And we're having a lot of our service men and women come back with some real issues that we're just now, I think, if anything, is we're just now really providing a safe place for people to express their, their need for help. And yeah, uh, so I it's suppose, becoming more salient. I suppose the oh, <laughs> I was gonna say skyrocketing. Well, my wife hates that term, but the 
price of housing has gone up so radically in the last 10 years, 15 years. Is, is That's probably one of the big causes, right? It certainly is. They're, they're, they're doing lots of studies recently on even two perfect. It's, it's not just having a two income household. It's almost having a two professional income household on top of uh, child care, which in and of itself can be the cost of uh, running a, a single room apartment. So there's a lot of factors there. Assen essentially, the, a lot of the workforce is not paying a wage that I know this is a much broader issue, but not paying a wage that, that is livable. And then affordable housing, you know, you're, you're going to hear that common denominator quite a bit. I don't want to be a broken record on that, but all the data supports that there simply isn't enough affordable housing. And we're taking a vulnerable population and tipping that over the edge into homelessness. And there is a, I know earlier, one of the, somebody had mentioned in 25 to 50% of uh, co-occurring disorders or substance abuse with mental illness and homelessness. We're getting those numbers for people that actually admit it. It's much higher than that um, if you really look at it. But again, it's not just a, a disease in the, sake, in the sense of a disease. It is, it is an end result of life symptoms in many ways. And um, uh, it, it's uh, for us to have a robust treatment modality to meet those needs is what we're going for. That's what supportive housing is. That's what the shelter is. We're going to do our very, very best should we get the opportunity to understand those unique needs and apply the appropriate resolutions to well, that. Well, end. Madam Mayor, I would like to particularly thank you and Councilman Engler, or, or Pro Tem Engler, and Ingrid, and everyone who has, you know, uh, put the shoulder to the wheel here and, and produce this outcome. It's probably not perfect. I don't think there is a perfect answer, but I like the two re uh, recommended actions and I intend to support them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Council Member McEnany. I just uh, four uh, comments and, and actually four questions. Uh, in the presentation, $1.45 billion is going to be made available from the state uh, to all the different communities. Uh, if someone could tell me how much is Thousand Oaks going to see of that $1.45 billion? Um, well, first of all, we do have to apply for the funding, so we don't know the exact number, but Thousand Oaks or Ventura County actually is lumped in with Southern... I believe it's the Southern County. I would have to look through the, the RFP, but basically they have, the state has a portion different dollar amounts to different parts of the state. So we don't know at this point how much we're gonna receive. And what happens when the state either stops funding or that money runs out? Uh, who, who is the one that's going to have to support the services that we're providing, not only to this location, as well as others that will pop up here in the city? Um, so just to answer, sorry, uh, Mr. McNamee, to go back to your original question, there's $101 million available to the Southern California area on a competitive basis. Um, the state is providing through this year's Project Home Key some dollars for operating subsidy. Um, and then um, I mentioned tonight some of the other funding sources that have historically been around to support homeless services. Um, and so when we return to the city council, uh, we will have a recommendation on how uh, we can support these two projects. So what I'm hearing is that we'll, we're looking at less than 10% coming to the Southland and no idea how many is, how much is gonna come to us, correct? Um, not at this time, we don't know. It's a, a competitive funding. So okay. we will find out if we apply for the funding. And I noticed that Salvation Army was one of the uh, vendors that was entertaining uh, a, a possibility of doing something like this. I've, I've had a lot of nice work with the Salvation Army and the good work they do uh, with trying to get people back on track and get purpose in their life again. Uh, what was it about Salvation Army that did not make the cut? Um, I do not have those comments with me this evening, but there was an evaluation committee that was made up of, of um, city and county staff. Um, and the two, I will say that the 
um, two recommended development teams in front of you had very strong proposals, and that was the agreement across the entire committee. Okay. And what happens if that permanent supported resident begins a family? Who supports the family at that point? What's the game plan? Well, you know, as many mansions mentioned this evening, they have permanent supportive housing, um, you know, for families. Um, I, I don't know if there's anything else to, to add to that um, by our experts who are on the call this evening in terms of how people may transition from being, you know, a single adult to, to having a family. Thank you. If, I'm, if I may conclude, uh, again, I am very near and dear to my heart is this homeless problem and how to address it. One of the issues that I always want to keep in mind of any program that goes forward is that it doesn't create pauperism and dependency. These are human beings. These are our neighbors. They're someone's mother, father, sister, brother, aunt, uncle. They need to be dealt with with compassion. I don't want it to be dependent on the city, the county, the state, or the federal government that they've got a pathway to independence. That to me is the greatest goal we can shoot for. And yes, there's a range of people that will always be dependent on the state. And then you run the other end of the extreme where I refer to it as uh, Joe the plumber or Eddie the electrician who has a trade down on their luck, couch surfing, they'll get back up on their feet, not worried about that, they're okay. It's the group that's in between that, again, I don't wanna create pauperism dependency when we brag about 96% are still with them two, three, four years later, I'd rather be more impressed with 96% have moved on and are independent of us and are living an independent life, no longer relying on the taxpayer and government subsidies and the housing that we provide. Because we have 242 homeless right now based on our count, and we're only providing 77 right now for permanent housing. So we're not gonna be able to take advantage of taking them off the street and giving them a place for food, shelter, and medication whether that be in the county jail or whether it be on uh, uh, subsidized housing, like what we're describing today. So any myth that we may have or any conception that this will uh, eliminate the homeless we see on the streets in our neighborhoods, it's not gonna happen until we exceed that 242, then the police can actually move in and uh, get them off the street and make them into a, a safe environment. Again, my, my business is right across the driveway from Lutheran, Lutheran Social Services that does a great job of providing for the homeless. I talk to these people, I see them every day. I have some patients of mine who are homeless and see them and hear their plight and what they're going through. So I appreciate what, it, what, what they're going through and wanna provide something that is more than just dependent housing forever and ever, and they're not getting off of it. Again, I don't want pauperism and dependency. I want independence and for them to find their purpose in life so they can move forward with uh, some pride in, in what they do every day. Madam Mayor. Thank you, Council Member McNamee. Uh, I, I do want to stress that um, I think it has been made clear from the very beginning that we will not solve homelessness. We can certainly manage it, but I am under no illusion, nor is there a myth that all of a sudden everybody's going to find a home shelter and will be off the streets. That is not at all the case, but certainly we can um, help to uh, manage it. We have Council Member Al Adam, followed by Mayor Pro Tem Bob Engler. Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor. And uh, thank you for all the participants tonight. We certainly had a wealth of information presented to us. And uh, it's obvious that we have a homeless problem here in, in Thousand Oaks. We've had it for a number of years. Uh, I came here in 77. Like Ed was saying, it didn't seem like we had this problem way back when, but, but we got it now. And we got to deal with it. And uh, but I'll tell you something: our homeless situation pales in comparison to other cities. Los Angeles, sixty thousand people homeless. Venice, a mile of tents along the boardwalk. My daughter lives in West LA. We go down there to visit her. I'm shocked at what I see: tents along medians in the middle of streets, tents on sidewalks. I don't want that to happen here in the city of Thousand Oaks. And I've said that to people over and over again, that it's not gonna happen. We're gonna do everything we can to prevent that. And I understand the citizens' concerns about quality of life and, and what this does to our city. Uh, we have 242 homeless people in the city. Uh, we've been managing the problem for a long time now. Finally, tonight we're presented with, 
with a solution. It's maybe a partial solution, but it's a solution nonetheless that I believe will alleviate to a certain degree the homeless problem we have in the city of Thousand Arts. Our residents are demanding action. We hear it every day. Now we finally have a chance to take some action and respond to their to their demands. Uh, their demands that we do something about these encampments. Their demands that we do something about the loitering that we see. We This is an opportunity that we now have to do just that. It's cost effective. Uh, it's cheaper to run these shelters than it is to have the have the people out on the streets. Uh, there's a great retention rate, as you've seen. I think Shangri-La is a good operator to the people that say, well, we shouldn't just provide a roof over their head. We're not. Shangri-La and, and many mansions made it clear that that's, not, that's only part of what would be provided here. There'll be rehabil rehabilitation services. There'll be substance abuse treatment. There'll be treatment for mental health. That's all part of the, the overall program. So I, I, and with the funding that's available, we can't turn our backs on a billion and a half dollars that's out there. And we're ahead of the game. We're ahead of most cities. We've got providers, we've got operators, we've got a plan. We'll be first in line for some of that money. And I think it's really, really important that we get it. So to me, after three years of, of dealing with this issue, now is the time. Now is the time to make a move. And I, I'm, I'm all in favor of this. And I, there may be another question or two, but you know, at this point, I, I, we need to be pragmatic and deal with the situation. And I think this is the best thing I've seen so far. So I would go so far as to make a motion that we, have, we do we have, approve. What? No, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Engler also had um, some comments to make. Okay, well, I can make yeah. the motion and then okay. Bob can speak. Okay, go ahead. Correct? Yes. Okay. So I would like to make a motion that we do approve 13A and we partner with Shangri-La and many mansions to create permanent supportive housing in the city of Thousand Oaks, along with an emergency shelter. Thank you. M uh, Mayor Pro Tem Engler. Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. And uh, I do agree with uh, Councilman Adam that uh, this is a good, good time to make a motion. So I'm glad he made it. Um, I think first off, uh, when we first started this discussion tonight, I think I said that I was really looking forward to the exchange of ideas and, and the discussion that we were going to have. And uh, between my, my council colleagues, uh, s staff, uh, our, our speakers, our public speakers, we, uh, and of course the, the, the uh, purveyors that may be uh, the benefit of our, our decisions tonight, I think we have really dived deep on uh, the homelessness issues. Um, and I appreciate all of our all of our thoughts tonight. Um, I don't know about anybody else. I saw a lot of pure hearts looking at a very difficult situation and trying to come up with solutions that make sense. Um, I think the, the point has been made several times and I'll, I'll remake the point. This is a big problem. We, we as, as a city, uh, can only take a bite out of this problem. Um, by doing what we uh, may do tonight, um, I think goes a long way to helping the problem, but there's always gonna be issues that will crop up. And I appreciate my colleagues um, uh, noting that. This is not gonna solve all the issues that we are faced with, but it is part of the solution. To continue, I think I was reading that uh, three or four years ago, we had a uh, hundred people uh, who are experiencing homeless in our town. Uh, a couple of years ago, it was 150. Now we're looking at 240. So whatever we are doing doesn't appear to me to be working. So the alternative is to keep on this course and to see further erosion of the things that people, some of our public speakers were concerned about. So let's try an alternative here. Let's do something that will directly affect uh, a number of people in town who are currently experiencing homelessness. Um, there, there's a lot of practical reasons for doing this, but, I, but really, uh, and I think all my colleagues would agree, this is the right thing to do. Um, many of you know that I'm not overly religious, but I, I am from a, a Christian uh, uh, tradition. 
Um, one of the one of the favorite quotes in the Bible that I know is Matthew 25 that speaks of um, you gave me food when I was hungry. This is this is the the words that I try to live by. And when I see the opportunity in our town where people are hungry, they're not clothed well, they need a place to stay. Um, and we have committed six million and six and a half million dollars of our own money to fix it. And there's a possibility of getting more cash from the state. I think it's incumbent upon us to follow that Bible verse. And uh, I, I would wholeheartedly uh, support the motion. Thank you, Mayor Potem Engler, and thank you, Councilmember Adam, for making the motion. Uh, when we started forming this ad hoc committee back in 2018, we did it because we were seeing, we noticed that the number of homeless people or those who were unhoused was increasing in, in the city of Thousand Oaks. That committee was consisting first uh, uh, of me and then also then council member Rob McCoy. We brought in over a dozen clergy to see if we could help solve or manage the homeless crisis with the help of clergy. Clergy were very interested. We had over a dozen churches come together or representatives from a dozen churches come together. They want to help and they are helping, but the thought of being single-handedly responsible for managing homelessness uh, or helping those who were unhoused was something that they were not prepared to do. Our churches and our community are doing wonderfully, serving lunches every day or preparing lunches, preparing the dinners and providing clothing. Uh, and most of those dinners really is homemade food, homemade dinners. Um, and so it became clear after that, that as much as we wanted the uh, private sector or th the churches to manage this, this, is, this was simply too large a responsibility. Um, I, my children have helped with homeless dinner since they were nine and a half years old. They know many of the homeless people. Yes, some of them can be scary because they suffer from mental illness, but by and large, uh, it was really heartening to see how, how my kids and other kids who were helping out and volunteering were getting to know these individuals who had fallen on hard times. And you cannot really start early enough to show your children or, or students what it is like to care for one another, what our moral responsibility is. And so we helped out at the Motel 6. We got to know more of those who are unhoused last summer during COVID. And I cannot tell you during all this time we were having meetings, Bob Engler and I, to see with staff to see how we could manage this. And I have to say, staff has done a tremendous job, and that I have to give credit to Ingrid, Ingrid Hardy, uh, a tremendous job to get us to this point. Over the last three years, we have been able to have a symposium. We have had a page dedicated on our city website as to what homelessness is. Our local newspapers have reported on the issue of homelessness on a regular basis. Our process has been very transparent. We have not been hiding anything at all. We have always given updates. And so to be here more than three years after this committee was formed, to me, is a moment of pride, and as Council Member Adams said at the beginning of the meeting, we are so fortunate to be able to make this recommendation, Bob Engler and I, to our council colleagues. Not every city can do that. We are really fortunate to be able to do this. And I hope that as historic as this decision is tonight and this consideration, that it will finally do what we all have strived to do, which is to help one another and to love one another. And we can only do that by taking bold action. So again, I'm very proud of staff, um, everybody, my colleague uh, Bob Engler, Council Member Adam, Council Member Ed Jones, and Council Member McNamee. 
So with that, I would like to go back to Council Member Al Adam, just in case he has something to say on his motion. Well, I appreciate those comments, Claudia. They're heartfelt, and I know you've spent a lot of time and effort with your family trying to help our, our homeless population. I think that's wonderful. Um, we're, we're an affluent community in Thousand Oaks. We're doing good, but we can even do better. And um, I've, I've, I've toured with Juan and Josh, some of these homeless folks, and um, can't have that. Can't have people living under freeways. Can't have people living in tents. We, we, we're going to we're going to give them some tools to recover and become part a good part of our society. And this is just a great opportunity. I'm really glad we're presented with it. So the motion stands. Good. Then I will ask for a vote. Councilmember Adam. Yes. Councilmember Jones. I just muted. I am. Councilmember McNamee? No. Mayor Pro Tem Engler? Yes. And Mayor Bill De La Pena? A very relieved yes. And Madam Mayor, that motion carries four to one with Councilmember McNamee voting no. And that deserves a round of applause. Thank you all very much. I appreciate that. That was a big step tonight, and we got it done. And with that, we will go to item number 14, our city manager, Drew Powers. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Madam Mayor. I know it's been a long evening, so I'll keep uh, my comments very brief. Um, I want to just acknowledge, and I know many have said it tonight, but uh, it, it bears repeating um, leadership uh, on a uh, tough, tough complex issue from uh, our assistant city manager Ingrid Hardy and a team behind her from city attorney's office, other city manager's office staff, finance office staff, and our partners at the county of Ventura in, uh, in helping to guide it. So I'm very appreciative of all the time, effort, and energy. Uh, this is getting the ball maybe to the 50-yard line. Uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot more work uh, uh, forthcoming. So this is uh, well uh, important step, not the end of the road, and we will uh, continue to move forward based on council's action. Uh, that said, uh, our next meeting will be the 12th of, uh, of October. Uh, hoping that that will be our uh, last uh, virtual meeting, perhaps for some time, because uh, that should be the, after that should be the conclusion of uh, of the math mandate if numbers continue to trend appropriately. Um, we will have a series of uh, department reports uh, that evening. Uh, we'll have our update on uh, much anticipated update on uh, state uh, housing legislation uh, relating to housing, parking, and various other uh, um, issues. Uh, also under that item, uh, the Community Development Department will be providing a comprehensive update on uh, timelines for all the various initiatives that are forthcoming and, uh, and the volume of work that they're managing today. Um, we also have our utility rate study uh, financial plans, uh, and uh, right now we're currently slated to have uh, a uh, municipal code amendment uh, initiation request uh, to allow religious facilities in an RO zone uh, from the Shabbat Jew uh, Jewish Center, and uh, that meeting will be on the 12th of October. And uh, that will uh, that is at least how the agenda is shaping up as of right now. Um, and uh, we look forward to seeing everyone then. Thank you so much. And we don't have any adjournments really for this evening in memory. So we will then conclude this meeting tonight until October 12th. We'll see you next month. Have a good night.